Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 170, Exploring the Multiverse, New Marvels, and Ancient Aztecs. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, working with you to make your game nights better. We record here live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and it's always awesome when we can see you here live in the lobby, our chat room. Tonight, we're going to be talking about our thoughts on the Marvel Multiverse Playtest Rulebook, the latest Marvel role-playing game. After that, I've got a review of Founders of Teotihuacan, a new standalone lighter game set in the City of the Gods. We wrap up with our usual week in review, where I've got thoughts on the downfall of Pompeii, Ex Libris, and Star Wars Unlocked. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. First up, a couple of quick comments on our Goonies content. Andrew Tucker says, love this film. And Andy Jewett says, thanks for playing and enjoying the game. It was a ton of fun to work on with Sen and Jay. Well, thanks for those comments. And uh, Andy is actually the artist for the game. So I do want to thank him, Jay, Sen, and the awesome folk at The Op for sharing our review with their followers uh, in multiple formats and multiple times. So thank you for that. It's always awesome to have our stuff boosted by publishers or designer or artist. Um, We got some great shout outs from them, and that is hugely appreciated. All right, well, speaking of feedback from designers and publishers, Mark Spector had a comment about the issues we found playing Garinto with Five. He writes, I felt awful that I tarnished the Garinto shine, and rest assured, I will change the instructions if we get to a reprint. Now, Also on the topic of Garinto, Nate Parker writes, Just played it today with three other guys based on your recommendations. It was a hit. Fast, accessible, awesome. abstract, an excellent game between the other heavier games we were playing. Well, first off, I got to say, I was so bummed when I noticed the rule of mission for five players. Like we were sitting there with a cat and Tori who backed it on Kickstarter and who we introduced the game to. They were part of the, basically the play testing we did. And we were just like, wait, this doesn't seem right. Like if you're playing with five players, why am I adding anything to the bag? Cause we're going to draft them all. And we did. And we're like, that's a little weird. And then we're like, Oh, how about we try it? by putting the layers up all by one. And that played a lot better. And well, it ends up, that should have been the rule. And that got omitted from the rule card that comes with the mini expansion that adds five players. Um, Well, I'm glad to hear that Mark's planning on fixing it as long as there's another printing, which now it's on you, okay? Everyone who hasn't picked up Garento yet, you gotta go pick up a copy because we just told you the proper rule. So you don't, it won't matter that the rule's wrong in your copy. And then we gotta make him sell out. So then he's gotta do a new print and he can fix it. And he can also do some of the other improvements we suggested, like putting a ring on the bottom of the tiles to tell them apart. As for Nate's comment, uh, this is a great indication of why you should all go buy the game because everyone loves it. It's not just us. All right, well, next, let's jump into some Tales from the Loop board game review feedback. Okay. Dyktor Sintron writes, Got this from just reading the description to play with my daughter, but after trying to get through the rules and reading your article, this game is not for us. Could have been simpler or easy to to learn, as to me, it was targeted towards families. Well, thanks for the comment, Sictor or Sictor. Um, They weren't the only ones who thought this game was targeted at kids and families, I guess, because uh, we had multiple people comment that they thought it was a kid's game. And um, I I, like I know what Tales from the Loop is, so I can't disassociate myself from that. And I know that it's based on things like Stranger Things and E.T., but I, I guess to like the average person who doesn't know any better and hear you're playing kids in the 80s, they think it's a kid's game, and it is most definitely not. Dave simply stated, Tales from the Loop is a pass for me, I think. Nice review, though. And Chris Groff said, great review, Mo. Martin Vasquez wrote, thank you for this review. I saw this at one of my local shops, and I wasn't sure if it was a good fit for my collection. I was kind of hoping for something a little lighter than challenging even to a seasoned gamer. Yep. Totally true. Like that is that seems to be the big problem with this game. Uh, besides the whole math issue, just the overall difficulty and complexity of it 
based on what you expect from the theme and the license. It's just, it's way more meaty. It's, it's, a, it's trying to be a role playing game without a DM. It really is. And that is not what your average board gamer wants. For more information on why, check out our review and see if you agree. I would strongly suggest if you're thinking of buying it, though, check out the review before purchasing. <laughs> oh, finally, Ralph Mazza says, I'm eager to play my copy. The okay. dice whiffage odds are the bane of all the Year Zero engine games. It's more tolerable for apocalyptic horror, not so much for the other settings they use it for. Okay. An easy solution is to count fives and sixes on a push, not just sixes. So if you okay. score a six on the initial roll, great. But if you have to waste time and push to get your, you get to count fives too. That often makes for a guaranteed success if you already know you rolled a five. The odds of a five or six on the first roll being quite good. Hmm. This makes it more of a resource cost and less of a whiff, while maintaining the possibility for the occasional failure. I do like that the core mechanics are very close to the RPG. Well, thanks for that, Ralph, and everyone else who uh, took the time to comment. So one thing that, that confused me there, I it's been too long since I played the role-playing game. But in this game, when you push, you have to re-roll all your dice. So you can't push if you have a five. Like having a five already showing on the dice means nothing. So I, that might be something that's different from the role-playing game. I don't remember. But I swear when we played the role-playing game, if you pushed, it was re-roll everything, not any number of your dice. So, so that may matter. Unless, I guess, maybe you could keep the optional rule. But a guaranteed success seems kind of... That seems to be pushing it too far the other way. A guaranteed success on a, on a push seems like a bit much. But I do like the improved odds of a five or a six. And again, it's going to be based on how big your dice pool is. So you're going to still have that curve of once you get up to the fives and sixes, you're getting into the really high percentages. Um, as I mentioned in the review, though, in the RPG, I didn't see it a problem, at least in Tales from the Loop. I'll admit I haven't played like Mutant Year Zero, or I don't even remember what other games are in that engine. There's a bunch. Um, I don't mind whiffing in a role-playing game because it leads to more interesting things. So I'll admit I did not always feel that way at all uh it took modern role-playing games uh specifically powered by the apocalypse games note i never actually played apocalypse world but i played some pbta games uh hydro hackers by phil and uh masks and there was at least one other i played that's when i started to learn that failure can be as interesting and sometimes more interesting than failure a uh, big credit out to the wear gator for some of that because man if that person knows oh it, it, it was presented if wear gators presented with the you can succeed, but, or you can fail. He's like, I'll fail every time. I'll <laughs> fail. I'll fail. I just want to see what you're going to do to me. Come on, bring it DM. Let's see it. And then that mentality was foreign to me for a long time. Worldwide wrestling would be another PBTA if you, uh, you've played. In yeah, there's a, there. There's another one I played. <laughs> yes. And failure again, like, like you don't necessarily want to win the wrestling match, right? What makes yeah. it interesting is when things don't go so well, or you don't want to nail that interview. So anyway, um, it works for me. I have no problem with it. Like, I, I, I have no problem with, with bad chances. Of, come on, I grew up on Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, where your main character had a ballistic skill of less than 30. And back then, you didn't add 20 for an easy roll. You just tried to roll 30 or less, or you missed. That was the game of whiffing every single time. And then when you did hit, the opponent had strike mighty blow and would roll out of the way anyway. But anyway, that's all great in a roleplaying game. Terrible in a board game. Terrible. Like, why? 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 Are they, when nothing happens. Like, like in this game, it was deep penalized, not something more interesting happens. No, I, I do like the idea of the the push being a resource cost as opposed to the to yes. the, the, the fail, you know, the another chance to fail. <laughs> All I right, totally well, next, agree. next, we've got a ton of comments on our topic of crossing the streams, using board games to inspire and improve your RPG sessions. Dian Li Zhang says, I'm looking behind us now, across the count of time, down the long <laughs> hall into history back. I see the Traveler game oh so long ago that I played in where the players playing in the Spinward march Marches played in the time of the Fifth Frontier War. The GM had a parallel game of the war game, the Fifth Frontier War, going on with the people who liked war games in our crew. So... Every so often, that gang would play a few turns of the war game, and those events formed the backdrop for the RPG events. And That's awesome. in at least two cases, we did things as PCs that impacted the war game. It was an interesting game. It did give the impression of a larger universe out mm -hmm. there where we weren't the center of existence, and it also made the campaign feel more alive. 
It lets those of us who like war games to mix two hobbies together while leaving those of us like me who found the world war games woefully boring out of the tedium. Since then, I've always tried to find ways to bring bigger events in the background into the campaign in player friendly ways, but never quite managed to capture the lightning in a bottle ever again. Largely because I don't like board war games. And at the time, there weren't any good regular board games that could be used that way. That is fantastic. That Traveler game sounds amazing. I, I want to go play that Traveler game now. I, I don't own that war game, but I know do know that's a Traveler war game that existed. And you know what we talked about? Like using Mighty Empires. Um, and and it, there's a number of these campaign games where you then go and play out the small battle or you then go role play the scene. I'm like, that's one thing. But this is like a whole different level where it's creating the background events in the world. And I love that. Like if I had thought of that back when we were doing the AD&D campaign that was already pretty much procedural and sandbox, if there had been some other thing going on in the background that it could be like, oh, this empire to the north fell. And, I, you know, one of the players was in that game of diplomacy that led to that, whatever, whatever it happens to be. I love the idea of it. I absolutely adore it. And I'm just thinking about like even the Tales from the Loop board game, right? We just talked about it, playing through a session of that. And then you play Tales from the Loop. And you aren't those kids. Those kids are off dealing with the bottom muck and you take the result of it and play through it. So you're, you know, you're playing your Tales from the Loop adventure that's, you know, go find the Russian spy with the gun before she steals the, the videotape. And it ends up all of a sudden this robot comes in and lights the school on fire, which is something that happened in the board game when we were playing. And you're like, what the hell's going on? And you see the other kids like running by, you know, trying to take care of it, but you've got your own problems. Oh, I love that concept. I really do. That is awesome. Thank you so much for that, Dianley. All right. Well, Ian Borchardt writes, I really want to somehow fit the encounter mechanisms from Tales of the Arabian Nights mm. into my standard sandbox encounter system. I haven't worked out how to get the characters to choose the exact encounter type they want without breaking immersion. Still, the random adjective on the noun with increasing potency with difficulty is still a really great mechanism. Now, that is an idea worth exploring. Um, Ian and I have actually gone back and forth after this, trying to refine this idea. So I'm not going to get into the full details of Tales of the Arabian Nights, but it's a very sandbox game set in the time of, you know, Sinbad and Shahrazad, um, that fantasy realm. And you will, like, meet a beggar on the street, and you get a list of adjectives on how you want to react to that beggar. And then you look up in a big spiral bound book what happens based on what you did. And there may be die rolls involved and stuff. But like you could get to the beggar and you could be generous or you could get to the beggar and you could turn them down. And being that world, that beggar, of course, could be a jinn or it could be the king in disguise or it could just be a beggar. And it's it's an extremely sandbox game. I've got to say for hardcore gamers who are trying to win, it's a terrible game. But for people just playing and exploring a world and telling stories, it's fantastic. Honestly, completely like I, I own this game, but I tend to forget about it. It's not one I'm, I'm never like, oh, no, we need to play again. Let's sit down and play a six player game of Arabian Nights. But we really should. I think this should be added to the list because I really think you dig it, Sean, for those RPG ish aspects. Now, note there are some problematic things in it. Um, gender swapping is an important part. Well, not important, but far too frequent part of the game. Um, I shouldn't say gender swapping as, as in that's bad, but um, uh, forced gender swapping. Mm -hmm. It just, but you can tell the game's a bit of the date, dated. And while it's also, of course, based on the source material, which had some of that going on. So there is a bit of that. And there is some um, other suggestive content and the types of people you meet may fall into some stereotypes. But realizing that, sitting down to play this game, I think you'd really enjoy it. All right, well, Todd Zercher writes, a while back, I played a solo game by combining Troll Babe and Barbarian <laughs> Prince. I had a blast with that hybrid. Now, there are some classic games. Like, like the, then you played a game of Nuclear War after? Like, wow. Um, some old school, early exploration, RPG-ish board games. I dig it. Cool combo. I, overall, I got to thank everyone who interacted with this topic. Um, I cut out a lot of replies. And I realized I kept some longer ones in there, but I thought they were some of the best. Um, this ended up being a really popular con uh, like conversation, and I would love for it to continue. So if you have... Further thoughts on combining board games and role-playing games? We would love to hear it. All right, well, I've got two more comments I want to get to before we move on. The first is from Ingolf Schaefer about our The One Ring unboxing. 
Mm. Ingolf has some bad news for everyone. You seem to have mis misprinted the dice in the box. The D12 should have the numbers 1 to 10 and two symbols. The 11 printed on the dice should be a 1 instead. Yeah, this one's big. So I, I wanted to spend a bit of time on this one just to bring it to people's attention. So this is huge. Uh, thanks, Ingol, for bringing this to my attention because I totally missed it, which is just kind of weird because when I first did the unboxing, I'm pretty sure I showed all the die, which is what he saw. And I was like, yeah, it's a D12 with the numbers replaced. And then I read the rule book and I was like, oh, I totally misread it. It's not a D12. It's actually a D10 with two additional symbols. Like, yes, it's a 12-sided die, but it should have been a 12-sided die with a 1 to 10 and two symbols. And while the dice I got, as did everyone else, have two to 11, which I'm sure messes with the math of the game. So first off, wow, free league. I'm, I'm sorry. Like I, I feel bad for you. This is, this is, that's big. They, they have printed a lot of dice. I actually have the numbers and how many they printed. They printed a lot of dice and, and this is such a beautiful, awesome product, like such a great um, tribute to Lord of the Rings and to the first edition, a great reprint that this is quite the blight for such an awesome product. Um, they're of course aware of the problem. They are working on getting it corrected. Eventually anyone who wants them will be able to get replacement dice at free leagues cost. Now this option is already open to people who back their Kickstarter. So free league is encouraging people to pick up a new print product, which I didn't grab the name of, but they have a new module out that there were good, was going to be a PDF reward for the Kickstarter. They decided to print it. And now you can order that. So they're hoping people will order this as a print soft cover product and ship the dice with it just to kind of offset that shipping cost. And if you do did back to Kickstarter and you like everything else they did, I recommend doing this, right? Like don't punish them too much. I don't know if it's their fault or the manufacturer's fault. They're not admitting blame either way, which is fine. We, we don't need to know. Um, as for the rest of us, they're going to be working on replacement system, but they're trying to keep their Kickstarter backers first because the game wouldn't exist without them. So I think that's totally fair. In this one case, you're not having the thing where you're going to be able to get them and read it. Now, one other thing I do want to mention, if you really want to be nice, you may not want to replace the dice. For one, this is going to cost Free League a lot of money. And if you like them in their games, you may not want to force that cost upon them. You want them to keep making games and put out new products for the One Rings, causing them to go bankrupt for reprinting dice isn't very nice. Not that I know of. I don't think they're in any risk of that. Now, along with that, there's honestly no reason you can't use the dice that are there. Um, the one basic thing you do is just count every 11 as a one. And they are, it already has two ones on it. It's not that far of a stretch. Um, but you could also just use them as they're printed, which will increase the success chance of all checks. Because unfortunately, the D12 is that I use on every roll. It's that D12 plus an additional number of D6s, possibly even zero, where you're using the D11 every time. So it is going to increase the chance of success on every single check you ever make. But honestly, especially with the box set, this is a game about hope and, and striving against darkness. So to me, having a higher chance of success in a Lord of the Rings game doesn't sound like a bad thing to me. Fair enough. Well, the last comment I want to highlight tonight is about our founders of Teo to Walk and unboxing. Dads and Dice writes, this looks so much more accessible, accessible than the Teotihuacan OG. Great video. Really looking forward to this one. So thanks, Dads and Dice. And I got to say, this game is definitely, definitely way more accessible than the original Teo City of the Gods, which I think was the intended purpose of this new release. So they nailed that. Now, I wanted to highlight this because stick around because we're going to be reviewing founders of Teotihuacan later in the show. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Well, tonight, I've got a question for Sean that echoes many similar questions I've seen all over the web. As a huge superhero RPG fan, I want to know what your thoughts are on the new Marvel Multiverse RPG now that it's out in the public, at least in paid playtest format so far. Now, before we dive into that, though, I want to talk some credentials. I want, I want to get some, some cred here to see why people should listen to us over other people. And you shouldn't listen to us over other people. You should listen to us and lots of other people and make your own decision. But why, why we feel um, we're capable of talking about this. So first off, 
Um, I have some RPGs, but Sean's the big RPG, superhero RPG fan. So how many super RPGs are in your collection so far? Well, I mean, here there's a there's a stat. This here is is a stack of, of a number of them, and that's just because I haven't actually read those yet. Uh, those aren't those aren't all the ones on the bookshelf. Uh, right now, I'm sitting on I believe about twenty physical copies of systems, okay. not including source books and 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 various stuff. Uh, and then I have another twenty five or so in digital only form. Uh, some because it's the only format they come in. Mm -hmm. Others I haven't been able to find in physical or just haven't gotten around to purchasing in physical or it's in some cases the physical hasn't shipped yet and i yep. just have the pdfs uh that, that i've downloaded uh until the uh physical kickstarter ships i gotta say like a a collection of 45 rpgs doesn't sound that big but 45 superhero rpgs i think that's pretty significant now you don't also don't just collect these right you just commented the ones behind you is basically your pile of shame your to read pile, pile your self of shame whatever you want to go by self of opportunity for those who prefer that term um you both run and play in various online supers games some of which have gone better than others indeed now while i haven't run all of those i mentioned by any means i have been involved in superhero role play in one form or another for a good decade or so both mm -hmm. as a player and a gm or whatever you choose to call that role for your game. Mm -hmm. uh, personally, uh, in games I'm running, I prefer editor as the title in a supers game uh, since I really try to push the comic book style and editor sure. just kind of fits fits in a little bit better. That fits for me. I always tell the players they're the guest writers, but I don't usually have a specific term for the DM, but that makes sense. They're the guest writers, you're the editor. Now, one final thing I think is worth knowing before we move on to your thoughts about this specific Superheroes RPG. Everyone's looking for something different in a Supers RPG. What do you look for? What type of Supers gamer are you? I know there's people out there who love the crunch and the numbers and initiative segments and counting inches and seeing how many pounds they can lift or how many squares they can fly. And I know there's others who are much happier with a purely descriptive power like force rays and some narrative cues where do you fall on that scale well as with many of our listeners i'm sure the answer has probably changed somewhat more mm -hmm. drastically during the pandemic to be sure now right now i'm leaning towards more rules light less crunchy systems with okay. a strong distributed narrative control in large part thanks to the need to play distributed online rather than sessions where all the players get together now, that being said, I do enjoy a bit of crunch in a Supers game. But, and this will become important, I have never liked RPGs that feel more like a miniature skirmish game. Okay. So what's more important to you then, if you like that, what, what, what type of crunch? So you want to be able to compare numbers? Like, right. is it for that compare two people to see where they are in a scale? So, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we have talked about this and, and I, I hit it on the head every time. I, I feel like a, a parrot, but scale. <laughs> it's all about scale. Uh, you can't do supers without properly without scale or a very, very narrow focus and, and okay. ignoring a whole lot of the super genre. But you can't really do with a Marvel RPG instead of a Marvel Absolutely. Streets RPG I mean, or Marvel, a Cosmic Marvel RPG. Right. Mar Marvel really plays to that whole, you know, from Galactus to, uh, you know, all your all your street level uh, folks in, uh, in in New York City there who are in Get Hell's Kitchen and cleaning and... up cleaning up Hell's Kitchen without much in the way of powers. All right, and on my side of things, I am also a Supers RPG fan. Um, I haven't read nearly as many different systems as Sean. I tend to find a system I like and stick with it um, for years for me. And actually, the first role-playing game I ever played was the TSR Marvel Super Heroes game, the Phase Rip system. That was my first role-playing game I ever played in my entire life. And honestly, and still to this day, impacts what I like out of a game. I have never been a level up to get more stuff to beat the bad guy to big, get better stuff to beat the bigger bad guy to get better stuff to defeat the bad. I just I've never been a fan of that. And I also always liked systems where you're getting beaten down and fighting against something bigger. And I think both of those come from Marvel. It was interesting because I had to really think about this and I had to think way, way back. Not quite as back as far as your Marvel TSR experiences. Right. But um 
similarly, and, and, and I think I may have actually blocked this out of my mind for quite a while because the first Supers game I played in was actually Palladium's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Mm -hmm. Now, honestly, I don't recall much about it. We probably only played a single session back in the day uh, because there was a lot of that that sort of went on in the in the RPG club we were both a part of. Mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, Palladium, honest to God, was my introduction to superhero RPGs. And I, amazing. I remember I got this making far. characters way more than playing that. Though I know we both were in a game under Tim Pine as a as yep. a GM. Assuming it was called GM, I don't remember. Now from. From Marvel, no, I'm not going to go through my entire history here, but I did try DC Heroes next, which to me was that scale. Like I, I will say TSR Marvel Superheroes was, there's inches and there's stats and there's bands, but DC went to minutia and crunch in detail. And I can honestly say, I don't want to ever have to use the log function on my calculator in a role-playing game ever again, please. Ah, yes, the Mayfair system. See, the problem was you were using a calculator. <laughs> it was designed based off of a slide rule because everyone had a slide rule in the 80s, of course. I, to be honest, I had one, and maybe that might have made it easier. Maybe that's <laughs> what I did wrong. I didn't use my slide rule, my dad's slide rule, when playing DC Heroes. Um, I did play other superhero games in there many years later, though, um, Speaking of playtest, since we're talking about a playtest document tonight, um, the awesome Cam Banks reached out to me and asked me to do some playtesting on the Margaret Weiss Productions Marvel Heroic Roleplaying. Um, this was a very different game. I this this was when I had my first tablet ever, and I loved Good Reader because all I got was like the preview documents. It was it was multiple separate PDFs, including one that was still a Word document, right? This game hooked me. Like, I, I had tried a couple other super games in the middle. I will admit I never played the big ones like Champions or whatever, but, oh, Marvel Heroic Roleplaying was awesome. But it was, it had a learning curve, especially as a trad gamer, trying to wrap my head around Cortex Plus was not easy. Um, what it took was playing it. This was the first roleplaying game that absolutely convinced me that you cannot make a final decision on a roleplaying game before playing it. Uh, no, we're going to be talking about Marvel tonight without having played it. Um, sitting down to play that game was completely different than reading it. This was a narrative system. Um, it's one of those, I tend to call them player BS systems, where the players try to BS the, the, the game master and get away with as much as they want, which can be brilliant and can be terrible. Uh, it depends on how well you moderate it. It was all about selecting from your powers and telling a story. And honestly, it has what to me now is my my judge on a superhero RPG is can Aunt May beat the Hulk by making him cry? And you could mechanically do that. To my, in my opinion, Marvel Heroic Roleplaying from Margaret Weiss Productions is the best Marvel RPG that's been published so far. All right. Well, sadly, this is one I still haven't dabbled in, but it does unquestionably hold a warm place in the heart of many Marvel RPG fans, to be sure. Oddly, though, I still actually hear more about Phase Rip yeah. than Heroic. It's true. Um, actually, another one, it's, I'll get to that in a second, sorry. Um, most recently, Sentinel Comics is, is the, the new hotness for me as far as superhero games. I have played this. I have not run it. I have read the starter set. I own the core book, so there's my pile of shame for, for RPG rule books. And I got to say, it's a fa fantastic system that I think splits the balance between some crunch and narrative. There are some very scripted things. It's definitely got a Powered by the Apocalypse influence on that of like you have moves, I guess we'll call them. Your powers have description ways to use them, but it used like the escalation system from Marvel Heroic and it has a, a fate point style system for affecting the narrative. So it, it, it may beat out Marvel Heroic role-playing for me if I played it more, but Sentinel Comics is not licensed. This is not a Marvel role-playing game. It is a standalone game set in the Sentinels of the Multiverse universe. I guess I should say it is licensed if Sentinels of the Multiverse counts as a license, but it's not Marvel DC. Now, sadly, my first experience at a Sentinels table was going to be like the week after the pandemic locked down in Ontario yeah, and was obviously literally canceled. So I can't speak with any specific expertise on it. Though, again, right now, it is one of the top options out there. And I really need to get it to the table because it may actually take over for me as yeah. a lot of people have really talked about that balance of crunch and narrative, mm -hmm. which is what I have really kind of always wanted um, and, and yet to find. So, 
So, so far, what we're finding out this episode is Mo and Sean need to get together and play these <laughs> games. So we might, we might have to plan this somehow. I don't know how, but it, it'll probably be online um, unless we need miniatures and stuff. But you can still do that on Roll20 and actually play through all of these. <laughs> um, so despite the number of games Sean has, I played more Marvel games than Sean has. Yeah. So that has made a difference. So I, I also have a copy of the highly sought after, the very vaunted, considered by many the best ever published Marvel role-playing game, which is the Marvel Saga role-playing system put out by TSR. So we're going back. This was card driven. This was literally a hand of cards you use to make decisions on new flip decks. Now I have played the Dragonlance saga system and loved it. I honestly think that is one of the best before its time narrative modern role playing games that was not modern at the time, like, like is from the past and people forgot how to play in between and then rediscovered some of the stuff that was in that game. Um, sadly, I have not taken the time to read this. I feel guilty because I'm like, man, if we'd pre played prepared for this episode like if i knew i was going to do this a month ahead of time i might have tried to read it beforehand but i managed to find a complete copy of it at city lights in london for 50 canadian and i couldn't pass up so so really like of all you need to come down and play explore that one with me because i haven't even done it but like i need to run i don't did you even back in the day play phaser at marvel with me not with you no no see i ran it for my cousin so much but there was a period sean and i weren't talking to each <laughs> other and went to separate schools and i must have been in that period but yeah, I'm, I'd like, honestly, I'm sure Tori and Kat would be up for it too. Like the next time you're down, maybe we'll do, instead of trying to fit in eight board games, we'll try to fit <laughs> in like two or three RPGs. All right. And, uh, you know, for me right now, it's Basques. Um, even after getting a bit frustrated with aspects of it, I'm mm -hmm. back to both playing and running it. Uh, it's both powerful in telling stories and really low friction for online play. I will admit, I like Mass. I have, I've only played Mass. I played it under three different DMs and had a great time every time. All right, let's get to what people really care about, I think. Now that you know a bit about of our Supers RPG background, let's move on to the latest Marvel role-playing game titled The Marvel Multiverse Role-Playing Game. Does it have 616 anything on the cover? Like, does it say the 616 nope. system? Nope. Or you only learn that once you're inside? Yeah. I wasn't sure if that was a subtitle. But yes, using an all-new system. So right now, all there is out there for this game is a soft cover playtest edition, a playtest that you have to pay for. So I'm going to start with that. I am not a fan of paying to play test someone else's game. Play testers should be the ones getting paid. So I admit it was with a bitter taste in my mouth that I bought this book. Though I will say what has been provided is pretty complete for what it is. Okay. They haven't released something with huge problems, though there is an online errata for things players do catch. Now, one thing to note is the number of forms it's been released in, in physical, Kindle, Roll20, and Demiplane, which is a digital tool set service that I actually hadn't heard of, but plan on looking at when I get the time. Now, Matt has really been pushing the Demiplane for people who want digital. I don't know much about why. Um, personally, I'm a little shocked they didn't go with PDF. Uh, their excuse is they didn't want piracy. I'm not sure if that's a valid excuse because I can go get the game in PDF right now if I really wanted to. I don't do that, and I don't recommend anyone else either. Yes, they. I don't think they should be charging for this, but I also don't think you should be stealing it if they think they can charge for it. Fair enough. Pay the price. Yeah, it, it's interesting that they use the term playtester or because actually in the front of the book, they credit their playtesters. Um, there yeah. is a full list of playtesters who are credited in here and were probably paid so why am I not getting paid as a play tester since that's yeah. what you're calling me? <laughs> now, I, I will fully admit that they're not the first. I would be calling them out a lot louder if this wasn't already done by Pathfinder and FASA with Star Wars and or not FASA, sorry, Fantasy Flight with Star Wars. So it's not the first company to do it. And the fact it's like a number one bestseller on Amazon means people are willing to pay for it. So fair enough. Um, I, I guess it's, it's also a collector's item. Like if you're going for comic book fans, you know, here you bought your limited edition graphic novel with variant cover that won't match the original. Yeah. Like overall, it must have worked. Like you bought it. <laughs> You've got a copy. So I, I, guess, I guess it worked. Um, so what do you get for 14 Canadian or whatever it costs? So the price is $9.99 USD, but with exchange and digital format taxes in certain areas and whatnot, it is a bit higher here in Canada. Now, what you get is a soft cover, 120 pa pa page full color comic book right the covers are a bit more firm than your standard comic book 
and the paper inside is glossy, but not great paper quality. It shows every crease and bend and flex and indent glaringly. So more the quality of a like a graphic novel yeah. than than a book. Yeah, and, and size wise, just to just to point out, it is exactly the size of a comic book. Okay. So. That fits, I, I guess, comic book collectors throw it on the shelves with the rest of their comics. Yep. All right. Now that we know what you get physically, how about the contents? What are we looking at here as far as setting, fluff, mechanics? What, like, usually I expect a role playing game book to go, here's an intro, here's how to make characters, here's the setting, here's how to do combat, and here's an adventure in the back of the book or whatever. What do we get here? Well, now the designer, Matt Forbeck himself, said to me on Twitter, there's only so much we could cram into 120 pages. And okay. while that's true, they didn't maximize their use of space as there okay. is a lot of art in this book. Hmm. I wonder if that was there for the comic fans. That said, you can get a description of the core Marvel, uh, core mechanics, the much vaunted Marvel 616 system, a rather thorough character creation, okay. combat system, and sample Marvel characters and a small adventure to try out. Okay, uh, that's all right. Um, so one thing I always loved in the previous Marvel games, you mentioned there's 10 characters. I loved reading about the Marvel heroes and villains. Actually, I had Tori hooked the last time he was over. I showed him my old red binder from uh, the Marvel Universe handbooks, which were like the monster manuals. And I was actually buying expansions for Phase Rip Marvel long after I stopped running the game for those books. If I saw them anywhere, I bought them and I would just sit and read them. So what do we, do we get that? Do we get a full description of these characters and who they are and who their secret identities are and their villains and who they get along with? And... Uh, you get 10 Marvel characters and a Hydra thug. Um, <laughs> sorry, agent, not thug. Uh, oh. That's it. Um, each okay. one gets, well, each of the Marvel characters gets one page. Um, one sided or one side, like... one side of one page. Okay. Um, the basically all enough of the details to, to sort of fill out most of what's on a character sheet. Um, <laughs> but you know, the rest you can kind of fill in yourself if you happen to know that character or have a, you know, what whatever Marvel's version of the who's who is DC, DC did who's who. I don't know if I forget what Marvel called their version of the who's who. Um, I think but, it was just Marvel universe, which yeah, is possibly. what the monster manuals were called. But uh, yeah, so it they I, I expect that there will be that sort of same thing in the in the future. Yeah, yeah. But what they've given you now is enough to cover what they've put in this 120 page book. I, I can't say too much because while well, the original TSR Marvel Superheroes Yellow Box came with four heroes, so and I think three villains. So honestly, it's it's more than you got. In that. <laughs> All right, so six one six. Everyone's wondering what's 616. Um, I do know this is a proprietary system. This is something created by Marvel or created by Matt or someone on the team. This is not based on any established uh, system, though I will admit from what I see, it's similar to Dragon Age, but not quite. Now, I know that it's 616 and that means something to Marvel fans. Something like every multiverse has its own number. So, so is 616 the cinematic or like the current comic book reality or like, some I don't even know. <laughs> so the main Marvel comic book universe is designated Earth 616. The MCU okay. is actually Earth 199999 for those keeping track. Okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> the book actually does state in its little intro page that your game is in its own universe within the infinite universes of the Marvel system. Not saying you can't cross universes, but they cover themselves so that you to avoid your home game messing with MCU continuity. <laughs> I get that, but then they shouldn't call it 616. It should be like six question mark six or something. <laughs> that's that's an odd choice to go. It's a 616 game, but it's not in 616. It's in your own version. That's an odd choice. All right. What so what's 616? What is this system? So this is a relatively straightforward three die system, with one of the die being a different color. D6, 3D6. Okay. With, uh, with one coat being a different color. If you buy an official Marvel set when they come out, uh, the one on the special Mar Marvel die will be a Marvel logo. Now, generally speaking, you roll three dice, add the results, and compare to a target value. That's, right. you know, there's, there's, there's bonuses and, you know, all that fancy stuff, but realistically, you roll your three die, add it up, and compare to the target value. Okay. But as you'd expect with 
having given us something a name, there are special cases. So first off, three ones is a botch. Not surprisingly, but a botch is actually pretty rare. Uh, three ones is one in 216 chance. So, you know, compared to a D20 roll, your, your odds of botching yeah. are, are reasonably low. Now, interestingly, while three ones is a botch, three sixes is not the best roll. It is, however, the highest value you can roll. So an 18 is still the best number you can get. Okay. It's just not the best roll. The best roll is two sixes on your regular dice and a one or a marble symbol on the marble mm -hmm. die. This okay. is what is called an ultimate fantastic roll. Ultimate which... fantastic. What are we watching? A J series? Like, sorry. <laughs> So this Super is this is not only an automatic success. So whatever you are attempting, okay. you succeed. There are also additional bonuses, and you get to ignore some some possible negatives that could have come up in the scene. Uh, basically, it's it's you know the best thing you could possibly ever do in a game. You are the hero. You are fantastic. Fair. Everyone cheers and bows before you. Uh, now, in addition to that. Anytime your Marvel die shows a one or the Marvel symbol, yeah. it is a fantastic roll. Okay. And now that is regardless of success or failure. Oh, nice. Nice. So this gives you your narrative. Yes. And, or no, but mechanics, cool. depending on whether or not the role was a success or failure numerically. And this fantastic role may also have a specific trigger of fantastic within your power, your specific power or powers. Okay. I, the ultimate fantastic roll and stuff. Ultimate fantastic roll. Like there's something about that name. I, 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 I really, if I, if I'm smart, I should probably record an ultimate fantastic soundbite. Like, you know, like, like something out of mortal Kombat. every time you start say distributing it. that so that people yes. can use that on, as on like a, a, a soundboard. <laughs> it will be like, like it's, it's gotta be a thing. <laughs> Uh, so do doubles do anything? The reason I'm asking this, I keep seeing people compare this system to the Dragon Age or the Age system, A-G-E system from Green Ronin. No, not at all. Okay. Because that also uses three dice and there's a one die that's a different color called your Dragon die in, in Dragon Age, at least, and in Fantasy Age. But what happens on that is your middle die is your degree of success. But when you roll doubles, you get points to spend based on that die to cool, do cool stuff. So it actually sounds quite different. So the overall is still roll three d six to beat a target number. Yeah, it's but this is not the target that. number. And if that one, if you hit a one on the Marvel die, then the magic starts, the you know, happening. Fantastic roll happens. Yeah, I, 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 I've been watching a lot of Ultraman, and I, I can't <laughs> help but ultra fantastic roll king dx. Like I just anyway. So you mentioned the game includes character creation. You said it was pretty significant. This, to me, caught my eye right away, and I'll admit was one of the selling points when this game, like the initial press came out. Everyone noticed on the cover there's like a grayed out question mark character, right? Which implies you get to be in the game, and I love that because many, uh, on actually on average, most of the previous Marvel games have either avoided character creation completely, wasn't an option, or provided a less than satisfactory system usually based on Here's where the these characters are at. So set your character where you think you are, right? So you're like, oh, I'm between Aunt May and 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 J. Jonah Jameson. So I'm a three, you know, or whatever. I don't know why I picked the two. Like <laughs> I was trying to think of two of the lower ones, right? <laughs> I guess I'm rating myself. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, James probably kicked my butt. Um, anyway, how does character gen work in the Marvel multiverse? Now I have to say. They have given a pretty hefty character creation system. And okay. unless I miss my guess, based on what I've seen so far, it's going to get even more robust in the final release. You have not seen the final form of character <laughs> creation. So rank is their character level. Um, mm -hmm. And that goes from one to 25 and determines things like how much and how many powers you can have. Uh, as well as your uh, number of, of points you can spend on your attributes. Okay. So this this brings in, again, back to one of my favorite topics in Super RPGs, scale. Street-level starters are going to keep their rank low, while Avengers are going to step things up a bit, and Captain Marvel is a 25. <laughs> okay. 
So now, yep. is this like levels and the fact you can level up? So yes, you can level up. Okay, but it's it's kind of one of those things where they don't really push it. Um, again, it's a lot of the superhero genre. While there there are two sides to this, there there will you will get into an argument in every forum. Uh, mm -hmm. But a lot of superheroes outside of, you know, the masks and the, the street level stuff is once you have your origin story, you're kind of set. You know, that's how the yeah. Marvel Universe has generally worked outside of other universes or, you know, that, you know, a, a, a something that goes off for a little while and then come back. Uh, so generally speaking, you know, you're, you're not going to level up Captain Marvel. You're not going to level up the Hulk. Um, so yes, you can level up your character if you choose to play a game that way, but okay. it's not a hundred percent the design form of the system. <laughs> I, I, honestly, that's good to hear because it sounds like you can, because there's going to be gamers out there who want to. Absolutely. But there definitely are. There's going to be gamers out there who are going to use this as beat up so many mooks to get enough XP to level up my guy so I can beat up more mooks. And we kind of went over this earlier. <laughs> and there's going to be the people who are like, well, no, it's so like, I, I Peter Parker maybe gets into the Avengers, but that's about as far as he's going to go. Yep. So uh, one thing your rank determines, again, like I mentioned, is your point spend for ability scores. Okay. Now, ability scores, uh, I'm not going to list them all off, but they're actually called Marvel. So the the the, the acronym Marvel is all your different score scores, me mental, agility, whatever they all are. It's easier um, to remember than phase rip. <laughs> exactly. Um so the scores are actually on a plus four to minus four range. So okay. zero is your kind of average Joe, uh, and then plus four, minus four. Now, okay. you're not stuck within that level. Uh, with, with there are other, other aspects um, will give you a, a, the ability to beyond, go beyond that. But your basic, you know, mm -hmm. average level is plus to minus four. So next you get archetypes. Uh, and so far, there are only six of them. But again, that's something I do expect to uh, come on. And that this is things uh, like Blaster or, you know, they're, they're sort of your, your class uh, your class. And they modify your character further mm -hmm. um, as a character class often does in, in many RPGs. Are we talking like mutants versus altered humans? You so the difference from the original uh, the different game ones is actually a uh, striker. Um, oh, it's so, more role? so Black Panther is a striker. Captain America is a polymath. Uh, um, polymath. Uh, Captain Marvel is a blaster. Uh, okay. Groot so it's more like loser. MMO. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, very, it's very more MMO like MMO classic. party roles. Yeah, yeah. yeah ab absolutely. So, uh, you know, character class in, a, in an MMO term is, is, is very, very yeah, more so than the D&D &D term or an origin. Because the previous Marvels tend to do that altered human mutant. Right that techie rich person whatever i don't remember them all i i, I remember the first two right now of course there are powers <laughs> yeah. now powers are arranged in sets of powers so you get basically a cloud of powers um and you can uh, other steps will determine how many powers and from how many different sets you can choose okay um and, and again your uh scale the scale here your um is limiting where you know how many of uh, how far down that chain you can go so you can't mm. get all of the powers or you can't pick the higher powers from a certain set if you aren't a high enough rank um one of the interesting ones that people uh, that i've seen people call out is you can get thunder but you can't get lightning until you're like uh or you can get <laughs> thunder at rank five but you can't get lightning until rank 15 uh, it's a um, little silly okay so you know um so one one question um one of the big things in phase rip marvel were power stunts how limited are these powers like like are they you have web slinger so you can shoot a web line and swing and that's it they're, or they're, is it i can shoot web so i can wrap people up i can hit people i can tie things there, I can... there are actually uh seven different web powers Okay. But allow you to do those very different things but each one is, is a... pretty narrow and specific okay. but when it comes to stunts there is the fantastic so when you make uh, those okay. fantastic rolls sometimes you're going to be triggering what you when you know what you would probably call stunts but they call okay. fantastic actions or whatever within the powers um of, of things to go so uh Can you beyond... change it so that if i'm playing spider-man they're all they're they're amazing roles 
<laughs> okay. uh, one Ultimate of the, amazing role. Well, one of the really interesting things um, is there is a power called wisecracking. Um, these okay. are called utility powers. Um, so that anyone can grab these as a set of utility powers that aren't listed in any one of the individual sets. Uh, wisecracking is one of them. But interestingly, okay. if you make an ultimate fantastic roll, you cause damage as a wisecracker. Uh, I, that, that, is there more than one type of damage? We're probably doubling there a little this deeper is actually, than I planned on. Yeah, so this is, that, that is mental damage, not physical okay, that, damage. I, I have less <laughs> of a problem with it. As long as it's not like yeah. your hit points go down because yeah, he made a witty bar. There, there, is, there is a difference between mental and physical damage. So. Okay. Fair enough. Um, yeah, like we're going to get into some detail. I want some crunch, but I don't, I don't need to know every little... <laughs> How so beyond are. beyond the uh once you get past the archetypes and the powers and yeah. your your stats then you're just getting into basic descriptors and you know filling out your character sheet with all the okay. other stuff you want to fill out now does it have anything like um like you played some power or not power by apocalypse i'm drawing it to aspects or you know like your inspirations your keywords any of that type of stuff there, that we tend to see in some modern of that, games there is some of that in the book um uh, it doesn't really make much it doesn't make okay so it's not addressed but it looks like it's going to be it's there. there yeah but it's okay. there is there is definitely there to give people inspiration when building sure. their character so you're not just stuck with uh you know blank sheet all right so with the mmo rules this actually goes well into a question we got on our patreon before this episode went live so dave asked do you think this is the sort of game where team synergy will be a big deal that you build around like spider-man makes webs and the hulk tosses people in them so i think they want it to be and okay. they have taken some steps with what they call these utility powers that I was mentioning. Uh, and some of these, uh, as well as comboing other powers, could certainly be used in that way. Okay. Now, they haven't, at least in this document, delved deeply into that aspect of their use. Fair. But Fastball Special is there as a specific utility power mm -hmm. to appease all of the X-Men fans out there who you know are going to be immediately oh, yeah. trying that. Totally true. No, I get that. I like that. Um, like, so as soon as you mentioned the roles too, like having a blaster and a this definitely implies that whole you're going to try to make a group of mixed. Yep. I forget what you called them. Not Archetypes. classes. Archetypes. Thank you. So moving on to the adventure, we I think uh, we we're we're kind of skipping over combat, but so there's one adventure in the book. Now I don't want to spoil anything, but how long would this take to play? Like, is this is this a you know, Lord of the Rings, the one ring starter set where I've got probably a year's campaign if I really wanted to stretch it out, moving my hobbits through the Shire. Or are we looking at like a single session, kind of learn the rules and you're done con game? So this is a one shot, 100 yeah. um, percent. An experienced GM using pre-gen characters would be able to move this pretty swiftly, and I doubt it would take a full con slot. Wow. Okay. Um, you know, you, once you get into the teaching, the system, or generating characters, you might be able to to, to fill a full con slot, but it's it's four pages. Okay, <laughs> so on, to be honest, that sounds more like a play test. Like, like some of the best play tests. I, I play tested Feng Shui 2 for Robin Laws, and what he sent was the adventure in the back of the book. Right. And he said, run it as often as you can. Tell me everything about the sessions. Record them if you can. Tell me everything you can. And that is a single session. It's actually a con game that he used to run that he found was really good for introducing the game. So to me, that that, that doesn't, it fits what this product is, but yep. I'm disappointed. Yep, no, absolutely. Again, we're paying for this. And yeah. that's, it, you, the paying for it is what makes it a disappointment. If it was yeah. a free, you know, hey, we need you to test Here's, this. That's a whole different story. Yes. But because we're paying for it, it feels a little bit tight. <laughs> I agree. I agree. So we we kind of, I kind of skipped this in the notes, but I did want to touch on this. I just totally forgot about it. Combat. It's a huge section of the book, right? You're mentioning that's yeah. that's like a, a, the biggest part of the book is the combat session. I don't want to know turn by turn, but what are we looking at here as far as a combat system overall? So you are looking at. I mean, you're going to want to more than likely use minis. Uh, okay. There is it's it. You know, powers have specific ranges in you know spaces. Um, mm. Everything is, is is sort of grid focused. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, I'm not a big fan of the, the super hyper miniature combat. And this really kind of lends itself to that. Um, right. Everything, as I said, you know, uh, the, 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 <laughs> the, the utility power wisecracker is Does an attack game. mechanism. Um, everything in the game currently is designed as some form of combat. 
Um, that's really what they have doubled down on. Um, the the adventure is combat. Um, it talk mm-hmm. the DM tells you, do you want to go in and go and kill people sneakily, or do you want to go in the front door and attack everyone on mass? That's kind of the 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 choices you wow. get as players in the adventure. Um, there's you know here's a little bit of a setup to let you know to let you get an idea of how you want to attack people. And now, are there maps to fight these combats on? There, there is. There are maps both in the book and available online. Uh, again, in the book, one of the problems with printing out a comic book sized book is things are tiny. So yeah. the map is tiny. But what's even worse is the character sheet, which would be reasonable on an eight and a half by eleven sheet sheet of paper. Mm. At six by ten, is really tiny and 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 oddly shaped. <laughs> so I recommend going to the website, which we'll give later when we're talking a little bit further, and downloading the map and the play- character right. sheets from there to print out. So for tactical combat, do you have all the tropes of like you're going to roll initiative, and it's is it a you roll the hit or is it opposed? Again, everything, give, is oppo- comp- everything is against a target uh, target value, and that target value is either another player's uh, defense stats okay. or uh, or a, a set by the uh, by the GM. So all that, that's a good thing, at least to me. I, I hate opposed rolls. I hate the, I hit. No, you didn't. I, yeah. I hate that feeling in multiple ways besides the, the latency of two players having to make rolls. No, no. So that's an improvement. It. Now, I, I what they haven't just got delved into is PvP. Um, and so if you want to have, you know, Spider-Man and, and Hulk fight oh, as players. So the characters they, can't actually fight each other? That That's surprising because that's a Marvel thing. No, they haven't delved, again, they haven't delved into that yet. That is more so, so, than likely something they are they are holding off onto for yeah. the the play test. But uh, in my does, reading, that didn't come up. Yeah, uh, that's actually interesting because it does point out something else, which means the villain stats are different than the player stats, obviously. Well, again, there's only, you there's just only one villain in there, um, although they do talk about uh, possibly using, uh, you know, basically just flipped uh, using vill- uh, heroes as villains. So using the okay. same stats as uh, from a hero as a villain. So. Yeah, but it's obviously if you don't have player versus player, there must be different mechanics for interacting with a villain. So well, the, I mean, the, the only thing you're going to do is attack them. So yeah. you have defense stack, they have <laughs> defense guess. stack. There's not, there yeah. isn't much in the way of interaction in this system yet. Well, it just sounds like then you could play PvP perfectly fine. Yeah, no, you, yeah, yeah, I suppose you could. Like if the mechanics are the same on both sides, you should be able to just do it. Yeah, no, that's fair. Anyway, um, probably enough on that. People could, we're, we're not going to give you all the details. You go buy it yourself <laughs> if you want it. Um, so, the other thing I always like out of a good starter set is now that I'm done, I played the adventure in the back of the book. I, I usually want to do one of two things. And one of those is go play the main game, right? That's going to be the big goal, but that's not out yet. So the other thing is continue using those beginner set rules or the, those play tests. Is there enough here for, we'll say an experienced DM, like not someone new off the street, but someone who's run games before to take this and kind of make up their own scenarios and keep going with what's in there? I think it depends a lot on what you want to play. Um, as you said, a skilled GM should have enough to work with here to be able to experiment with the system beyond there in the adventure. Um, okay. But outside of an experienced GM who knows how to craft things from scratch and know, you know, if if you're a if you're an experienced D and D player who only ever runs scripted adventures, you're probably going to be you know okay. struggling a little bit. But if you're someone who's used to you know pulling up uh, you know doing some sandbox adventures or or you know making up something from scratch then yeah, there's probably enough information there to go to play right. out a little more. And it is worth noting, this isn't a beginner box. This no. is a play test yeah. document, right? So it's not like I expected there to be hand-holding for yeah, writing it's, it's an ash can. It's how, you know, it's yeah. described much of the time. All right, I think that's a good summary of what you get and that. So as a superhero RPG fan who plays and runs multiple different games, what do you like about what you've seen about multi- Marvel Multiverse so far? So I think the character creation so many people are happy to see a mm-hmm. character creation system and while it has its limits it's more robust than one might expect from marvel right marvel wants you to use their their mm-hmm. ip and and love their ip and 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 fawn over their ip um yeah. so the fact that you're getting this significant character creation and again i still feel like he's got more to give us um that mm-hmm. there will be more of it in in the uh, final book, there's a very solid way to bring your ideas 
into the Marvel universe in a way that I don't think we've necessarily seen uh, this thoroughly in any Marvel game yet. One thing I missed earlier, you said there, there's 10 characters in there. Can you play a Marvel character? Yep, yep. You, like, you, like there are pre-gens? Yeah, okay. yeah, ten, I'm yeah, like, the wait, ten, the maybe you can only make characters. Are, are essentially pre-gens, so. Okay, I, I wanted to, I'm like, wait a minute, maybe you can <laughs> only make your own. I didn't thought of that. Nope, nope. All right, we got what you like. What about, what didn't you like? So, this game is extremely limited. Mm. As Matt said, you can only get so much in. And as a result, they chose, it's just combat and character creation. Now, that makes a degree of sense. Combat is unquestionably a vital aspect of not only a super system, but Marvel in general. Uh, but even with the adventure, it is about which combat the methods, again, the, which combat methods the heroes choose to solve the problem is right. the adventure, right? It's, there's nothing involving skills in uh, out of combat activities, nothing, mm. uh, just nothing. <laughs> so you can fight. I, I, you keep saying like oh you can only fit so much 120 pages i'm like i've played fantastic two-page rpgs well, so I mean, my argument would be uh the four color hack is 80 pages yeah uh, exactly. it's a complete system uh, that, and it's like, also or it's also comic book sized <laughs> and i'm just like like 120 pages is not a small amount i, I get it, it's marvel and i'm sure there's a lot of marvelness in there that takes up extra space again uh so you know, and, i'll do and, a, i'll do a quick little little flip here but you know Pretty much every page you have art. A lot of art. A lot of art. A lot of art. You're yeah. you're not going to find a page without you know a quarter of your use usable two page spread minimum, yeah. taken up with really nice again, it's you know, great quality test. Marvel art. But I want to play the game and I want to learn about the game. Yeah. I know what Spider Man looks like. But yeah, and it's a play test. Like like I expect less art in a play test. I want to play test the rules, not say you have a pretty book. But, but they I guess need that's to a justify, way to they for need it. To justify yeah. it to I say so you flipping through that, it looked like you had a wizard magazine. <laughs> <laughs> it really did. All right. So it's a play test, which means you're supposed to play it and or read it or do both, hopefully do both, and then give your feedback. What have they done to be able for people to provide their feedback? I do really hope they've done something so, so people can at least complain or say it's awesome. So thankfully, they have done this right. So if you go to marvel.com slash rpg Easy they have enough. a forum you fill out that has a few multiple choice questions to you know line up their their answers but then also open forms to answer enter your thoughts and opinions uh in in multiple you know areas mm -hmm. so i have already most certainly taken advantage of this as well as reaching out to matt on twitter uh and i may well again i you know i'm probably going to do at least one more read through of this and and you know take take advantage of of the time and probably make more comments in the future all right so so far based on what i'm seeing in my social media feeds um we're not the only ones disappointed by the direction this seems to be going now again this is a a, a segment of the game like, we're really hoping you're going to have all that social secret identities, getting phone calls from Mary Jane in the middle of fight moments somehow put into this. Because if they don't do that, it's not a good Marvel RPG. Um, what are you hoping for the result of this playtest? What are you hoping gets changed? What do you want to see changed in the rules or added as a result of this paid playtest that's going on right now? Yeah, and my socials as well. The opinion has been less than positive. Uh, we've had some really long discussions about this on the RPG Discord uh, that you and I are both a part of. Um, and honestly, I kind of feel sorry for Matt. Oh, yeah. I think the limitation on what could be included space-wise was going to cause problems no matter what he did. I'm sure he had no say in how much space there was, Probably how much not. art was in there. He, he was given what he had. And that's, you know, understandable given, given the, the corporate uh, backing of this whole thing. It was going to cause problems no matter what. It was, it may have been a no-win situation. Yeah. Now, what, to be honest, I should, I should call this out, actually. This is being published by Marvel, a.k.a. Disney. Yes. This is not being published by an established, well-known role-playing game company. This is not Wizards of the Coast. It's not Green Ronin. It's not Paizo. This is Marvel publishing this which is actually a first for a marvel license Absolutely. this is being published by marvel and i am sure their level of creative control is way more than any rpg designer probably wants to work under well absolutely 
Um, so what I want, and the reason I specifically reached out to Matt on Twitter is non-combat. So yeah. I want Spidey to have to work to hide his identity at school. I want Bruce Banner solving science problems. I want Natasha and Yelena sneaking around, getting info without killing people. So unfortunately, based on Matt's response, I don't think that exists yet. Oof. Now, it's on the table. But apparently, the playtest response is how they will choose in mm -hmm. what direction they're going to go for filling out the rest of the book, which is apparently going to be about a 300-page uh, book. But then, again, with the art requirements in this book, you wonder how many usable pages there will actually be in a 300-page book. Well, so here's yet again. Uh, people provide your feedback. Um even if you haven't bought it, go provide your feedback and say, I, we know there's no social, there's only combat, give me more. Yeah. And then maybe we'll get, get it. Um, I, yeah, that's interesting. I, so that, again, why didn't they do it free? I don't, I'm, I'm still kind of <laughs> baffled by their, if the, so the game is not written. If I, again, they haven't even like, decided based on, based where on the response I it. was given, um, mm -hmm. you know, he said that was something that we might do. <laughs> so for a book that's coming out in in a, in two years less than two years oh that's nowadays that's not that surprising a timeline so <laughs> all right so anything else you want to share about the current state of the marvel multiverse role-playing game so right now to me personally this isn't an rpg system it's a combat hmm. simulator uh in the discord i got uh, i called it marvel Sp smash brothers for tabletop um Again, everything in the game is about damage and combat. Uh, it's, it's just about fighting. And while that would make a great skirmish game, that's not what I call an RPG. That's fair. I totally can see it. Now, I will give the same conceit I mentioned earlier. Um, the original yellow box TSR Marvel superheroes, uh, though they managed to do it in a nine-page rulebook, uh, is a combat game. It gives you four heroes, it gives you villains, it gives you maps, and it gives you tokens to put on those maps and gives you a battle called Day of the Octopus. So I can't be too upset about it when the game that got me started on role-playing and the first Marvel game kind of did the same thing. Now, I would like to think that the future and other Marvel games have proved that people want to tell other stories than who can beat up who, um and well based on what you said it sounds like the playtest may go that way it's on the table right so let's hopefully we get to see some of that so that's it for our thoughts so far on the marvel multiverse role-playing game i'm sure we'll be talking about this one again in the future as more content is released and it'd be really awesome if we can somehow get in an actual play at some point maybe that's something we can work out online or not It'll be really interesting to see over the next two years or so how this game evolves and changes as time goes on. Indeed, with, you know, 300, more than double the, the page count for the final document, last I heard, there's a lot of room for growth from what they have now. Mm -hmm. And I really do wish Matt all the best in his development of this system. Totally fair. Now we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. If you got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, email questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Hit me up on social media where I can be found everywhere at Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Welcome to our review of Founders of Teotihuacan, a standalone game set in the City of the Gods. Before we start, a quick shout out and thanks to Board and Dice for sending us a review copy of this board game to check out. All right, Founders of Teotihuacan was designed by Philip Glawax. Features artwork from Chui de Leon, Odysseus, Stamoglau, and Alexander Zawada. I do apologize on my anglicized pronunciations of those. Now, it was published by Board and Dice here in North America with copies just hitting stores earlier this month. Now, this new Tale to Walking game plays one to four players, with each game taking under an hour once you've gotten the mechanics down. Now, Founders of Tale to Walking has a $50 US MSRP. Before we go further, I just want to reiterate that this is a new standalone mm -hmm. game. While it shares the name, theme, and some of the mechanics of Tale to Walking City of the Gods, 
This is not an expansion, new edition, or really even a re-implementation of that game. Uh, having or knowing the original is not required to play or enjoy this game. When founders of Teotihuacan, players compete to create the best design for the City of the Gods, including its buildings, temples, and of course, the Grand Pyramid in the center of the city. Now, this is all done through a unique action selection system. You'll have to balance resource generation and building, as well as work within districts based on a tiling system where you can only build in the district your architect can see, and they're going to move around your board each round. Points are awarded for a number of things, as well as having temples that match the tiles in your central pyramid and competing the requirements of god tiles. And in the end, the builder with the most points is at the end of, at most, four rounds wins the game. So check out what you get in this lighter, quicker Teotihuacan game in our Founders of Teotihuacan unboxing video on YouTube. So the copy of the game I received from Board and Dice was technically a pre-release review copy. Now it is a complete game. This was not a prototype, this was not a play test, but it was a pre-release. So what I got may not exactly match what you get in the retail copy. So when watching that unboxing, be aware of that. Now, the one thing that I know won't match is that my copy didn't initially have enough cubes to be able to play it at four players. Now, thanks boards and dice, they tossed in some extra cubes along with that game. Now, for me, these weren't actually the same color. So if you do see me sharing pics of this game or you check out of my written review, um, this isn't something that's going to happen if you pick it up. Your cubes are all going to be the same color. Also, no, who cares? Like, like, they're close enough. You can easily tell the gray from the brown from the gold, even if there's slight variations between the individuals. So great to see the publisher making sure that even preview copies mm -hmm. are complete so that they can be reviewed thoroughly. It would have been easy enough for them to have just said, sorry, can't play with all player counts. Or I might be here going, what the heck? They didn't give me enough to even be able to play what's happening, which actually happened with another game recently. Now, a port? From the cube problem, everything here is decent, but nothing really outstanding. Um, there's a lot of cardboard, and unlike the bigger Teotihuacan game, you aren't getting um, the over-the-top things. Like there were some like mahjong-like tiles in that. You're not getting that. Instead, you've got a main market board um, that is like jigsaw fit instead of a fold. You've got individual two-sided player boards, symmetric and asymmetric sides. You got wooden cubes and discs. A uh, large wooden meeple. There's some of the biggest meeple I've ever seen that ha still have that standard meeple size and a ton of cardboard tiles. You got uh, pyramid pieces, you got buildings, you got temples, you got temple tiles, you got mass and even more. Well, now that we've got a good idea of what you get in the box, how about you give us an overview of play? All right, so to start off, you're going to pick which side of those player boards to use. Again, there's a symmetric side and an asymmetric side. Everyone uses the same side. So either everyone's all symmetric or everyone's asymmetric. There's no like, hey, you play asymmetric, I'm going to play symmetric, which would make some of it, whatever. You're going to you're gonna pick which side. You're going to take the board. You're going to take all your components of the color, of, of your color. Then you're going to put your architect meeple. It's a giant meeple on one side of your board based on where you're sitting. Then you're going to play scoring discs and favorite tokens on the lowest spot on a couple of the tracks so you keep track of your score individually. And then there's a pyramid track up on the main board that you can go up. You can't have a, a one of these um, Mesoamerican themed games without a track, it seems. That seems to be part of Boards and Dice's design. Now, the central market is populated with buildings, temples, and pyramid tiles, and the sun and eclipse markers are placed on the round tracker. Bonus discs are randomized and placed on all the action spots, and there's three different areas of the board and multiple action spots in each area. Note, the player count will affect how many of these placements go out, like how many buildings and how many discs, with less available with less players. So is there a large difference in setup for player counts or just a few items? So it's mainly the amount of stuff there is to buy. With less players, there's less to buy because there's meant to be scarcity. There's no way all the players will be able to build a four-square gold temple every turn. That's basically it. Every round, I should say. And every round they're going to repopulate, and it's similar with that. Same with the number of action spots. With less players, there's less spots, so there's competition over those spots instead of everyone being able to go where they want every turn, which is something you actually need in an action selection game. Now, before the main game starts, everyone gets to place one of each of the three colors of pyramid tiles onto their player board, onto their central pyramid. They're going to get the associated bonus actions for those placements. More about those bonus actions in a bit. Once everyone's placed their three tiles, you now 
start the game. Now that you're ready to play, each round, players have a choice of placing one to three of their action discs, your little round discs, onto one of the action spaces on the market board, which again is split into three areas. Once you place it, you then decide to use that action to either build or influence. Those are the two different options. Now, the strength of that action is based on the number of discs in total on the spot after you place your disc. So action selection that not only chooses what, but how much of an action is happening. Right. And a big part of this is watching how many discs are there and waiting for other players. You have this, do I want to get there first or do I want to wait till someone else has gone? So when I go, I do more power or do I want to use three discs right away so no one can get in there? Now, at the start of each round, you're putting discs out on the spot. These are the bonus discs. And the first player to play there will get the bonus shown. Now, these include a bunch of things like getting an extra build or influence action, getting some points, increasing your power without needing extra discs, and so on. So there is a bit of a risk, or sorry, a, a, a rush to get those spots, just to get those powers. Or again, do you hold back and wait till other people have taken them so that when you do take your action, it has more power? Right. But overall, you know, easy enough, more discs is more good. Yes. So if you use all your discs on a couple big actions, you might have less actions overall, which could be bad. Now, the action spots are broken into three areas, as I mentioned, and each area has a build action and an influence action. We're going to start with the building areas. So the building areas are construct a building, construct a temple, or construct your pyramid. The power determines how big a thing you can build or how many additional resources you have to pay to place them. So it's how big a building or how much additional resources to place temples or pyramid tiles. When temples or buildings are bought, they must be placed in the two districts that your architect can see. So basically the board's divided into four. You have your architect standing on one of the sides. You can only build in the two quarters of the half of the board towards your architect. Nice little mechanism so you can't just place it any open slot on your board. Yes. Now, buildings, when placed, produce resources. Buildings make resources. They're going to make cubes that match the same color as the building, either wood, stone, or gold. The actual resources go on the board, which is kind of neat, and they go into spots orthogonally adjacent to the building place. So you kind of want to place your buildings so there's lots of room around them to get resources, and you don't want to group your buildings too close or be too close to the pyramid or be too close to the edge of the board, but then you want to make sure you have room for all your buildings. So that's a whole aspect of play. Now, temples don't give you resources, but rather cost them. So that's why you're making your resources to be able to get these temples out. Now, they don't do anything with their build, but are worth points during final scoring. You want your temples to match the uh, pyramid tiles you put into play. Now, also, when you build a temple, you get to take one of the face-up temple tiles. These you can turn in later through one of the influence actions, which I'll get to in a second. Now, pyramid tiles are added to the big pyramid in the center of your board. Uh, you get bonuses for covering up certain spots, which can be can be can give you extra actions and stuff like that again. And they are worth points at the end of the game. But again, these painted pyramid tiles have to match pyramids in the same district. So you're trying to pair up your pyramid with your temples. So you need to give up some of that instant gratification during the game for your end game rewards. Correct. Now, when placing buildings and temples, you're also looking for masks. Uh, this is the most abstract part of the game that doesn't really make any sense, and I can't really tie to any real theme. Every player board is a grid, right? And some of the spots are covered by mass symbols that are in patterns. Anytime when placing a tile, no, not resources, an actual tile, on your board, if you cover up an entire mask pattern, you get a tile that masks the pattern. And these are worth descending points. Like the first person to fill in purple gets nine points, the second person gets seven, the third gets six, and so on. So you need to, you want to be the first, but you also want to not compromise your other plans in order, just in order to get there first. Risk yeah, so in a way, that mechanic actually kind of matches and pairs well with the action mechanic. Because again, there's a, you could rush there first to get the bonus, but you might be better off holding off because you have better things to do. And that's it. That's the three different build actions, right? Build buildings, build temples, build pyramid. Next are the influence actions. The first one lets you produce resources. Every one of your buildings in play produces one cube of resource that has to be placed on the map. No, you have to have somewhere to put it. You then get to build two single square wood or stone buildings. So it's another way to get more buildings out. And of course, if you don't have resources, that limits everything else you might yes. want to do in the game. Next influence action lets you make an offering to the gods. You turn in one of those temple tiles. Remember, every time you build a temple, you get to choose a temple tile. You get what it says on the tile. 
Now there are a lot of these and the stack actually will rotate through multiple times. And when you use it, you put it at the bottom of the stack. So there is some memory element there. And most of these will give you points for trading in resources or having certain things in play. Like you must have three gold buildings in play if you do get five points. Now, other tiles include getting building or temples for free, where you get to build them without having to spend resources, or bonus build or influence actions. And when you get a bonus build action, you can pick any of the three builds. If you get a bonus influence, you get to pick any of the three influence actions. And you get points from any of these as well. Influence with the gods and or priests is always vital in so many cultures. Yeah, this is one of the carryovers that's in pretty much all of these T games. Now, the last influence option is gain favor. You move up a track. You get some points, and then you get the option to swap any one of those temple tiles you've collected with a face-up one. This can be useful because you might have had to take a temple tile that doesn't really fit where your strategy is going. You can swap it for one that does. So even in history, the bad stuff rolls down. You don't want to be stuck at the bottom of the period if you can make things better. <laughs> now the round ends once every player has placed all of their action tokens, which can mean that different players end at different times, then a new round begins. On a new round, your architect's going to walk around your city. They're going to rotate clockwise around your player board. So they're now looking at a different set of two districts. The bonus discs are re-randomized, and the board is repopulated with buildings, temples, and pyramids based on the player count. Sun token moves forward towards the eclipse token. And when they match, you now know that this next round you're going to play is the last round of the game, which is on the third round with three players or four rounds for all other player counts. Finally, and this is important, Everyone now loses one of those action discs and it goes back in the box. This is important because it means the number of available actions for every player diminishes as the game goes on. That's right. Less, not more as you go on. The mm -hmm. exact opposite of so many games. Now, at the end of the final round, there is a big final scoring phase where every player will score their pyramid that they've been building. These points, again, are based on having the right colored temples in the same district as a similarly colored pyramid tile, with pyramid tiles higher up, scoring more points. Once everyone scored their pyramids, the player with most points wins. Plenty to do, but relatively straightforward as far as hobby games go. Now, the game also includes a solo mode where you play against the first founders. For the most part, this is a pretty typical AI with the two AI founder colors taking up action spots and removing buildings, temples, and tiles from the game instead of them taking a normal turn. And like many of these, they don't even score points. Now, what really sticks out here, though, is there are three tables that you roll on at the start of any solo game with an included D8 die. Now, these three tables give you three challenges you face during play. At the end of the game, after four rounds, it's always four, you must have completed all three challenges. If you've done that, you then look at your final score and subtract 80, and then there's a little chart that tells you how well you did based on that. That's nice and very video game-like. We have talked mm -hmm. a lot about how some board games could really take advantage of some video game concepts, and here's one that has. So now that we've got a good idea of how to play Founders of Teotihuacan, how about you share your thoughts on this lighter Teotihuacan game? So uh, really basic, simple. The, the Assuming the goal of the game, and I have to assume this is, is what it is, is to give gamers a much more accessible, lighter, easy to learn, and faster Teotihuacan game. If that's the case, which I have to assume it is, the designer and boards and dice accomplished exactly what they're setting out to do. That is what this is. This is Founders of Teo is a significantly more approachable than its big brother. While I wouldn't go so far as to call this a gateway game, there's far too many options and choices and things you have to keep track of and ways to score. This definitely isn't a game that's going to appeal to the uh, gateway gamer, like a, someone who hasn't played hobby games before. But this is going to appeal to a lot more game groups than City of the Gods, which is honestly quite a monster of a game. So this is a stepping stone to cities, something to play first to learn? See, I don't think so, because what's important to note is that despite the fact they're both called Tale to Walken, there's not a lot in common with both games besides the theme. Like, really, the only crossover is the fact both boxes say Tale to Walken, and there's the same theme of you're building the same city. Now, Boards and Dice did point out this is technically earlier in the time period. 
So if you did want to play it, I guess you get like a whole tournament feel of here's where we're planning the city, which is supposedly what this is about. Whereas the other game is about actually doing it and building it. So it's a kind of neat tie in, but mechanically, I, I, well, I guess there could be an argument that your dice level up and that's kind of like having more power and the higher level your dice are, the more you get. I, I could be similar to spending more discs, I guess. I, I don't know. To me, that's a pretty big stretch. This is very much a standalone game with its own mechanics, its own gameplay, and really overall feel that is different to the original. Like due to that, I, it, they really shouldn't be judged based on the other game. And I almost wonder if naming it Tale to Walkin was a mistake as you can't help it. I can't help but compare these. They're both Tale to Walking games. As a reviewer, I feel like I'd be failing if I didn't compare the two, though really they are so different. It's interesting. I, I guess it really is just more about the Sun Temple and the location, Teotihuacan, as it is an iconic location. Yeah. Uh, it's a shame that it does allow for such confusion, however. I, my biggest concern is people picking this up thinking it's an expansion or not picking it up because they think it's an expansion. So trying to do my best to look at this as a completely standalone game, which again, it is. We found a lot to like. Uh, I will say the components aren't great, but they're functional. They're, there's nothing that doesn't work here. I'll admit I would have really liked some nice thick plastic. I don't know if they're plastic or Bakelite. The Mahjong-like tiles while building my pyramid. I'm sure that would have upped the cost, so that's fair. This is definitely a cheaper game than the full game. Um, the one thing that is a bit of a problem is the amount of cardboard in this box that uh, needs to be separated once you start playing. This is a game where people are going to be looking to find third-party box inserts, and I honestly don't blame them at all. Uh, the amount of components makes teardown and setup rather long for such a short game. And it's enough that I almost wonder if I'm wasting the time bagging everything because then I have to take it out. Like the, the, the sweep might actually be better and then just dump it and then spend way too long sorting it before you play. Um, I don't know. Right now I have it in baggies. Um, I, I might be considering moving to something better at some point. If, if the game keep, continues to see a lot of play, I, I may be looking to get something to control it because set up because the game's so short. If, if you are just going to plan to play a single session, it can be a bit annoying to set up. Now, what I recommend is play more than once and that kind of offsets that. So it has been released, but only just barely. So I haven't seen any inserts out there for yeah. it yet, but I'm sure it's not going to take long. Yeah, I've already seen people with their own foam core inserts that they've come up with. So it's definitely it's definitely a thing. Um, the rules here were particularly well written, easy to grasp. Um, despite the fact I totally missed a rule, but it's in there like six times. I don't know how I missed it the first time we played. First play is always extreme. That was us. Um, mechanics are easy enough to learn, uh, especially for anyone who has any experience, right? Any seasoned gamers are probably going to get all of the concepts in this really easy. Um, the one hiccup we did see at my table is the light math of figuring out how much extra you have to pay for temples and pyramid tiles based on your power. Something about a base cost, like it costs two wood, or it costs a wood and a stone, plus one additional stone for every power you don't have, that trips people up. Um, some of us are great at it. I can just look at it and I get it right away. I'm like, yeah, you have power too. It's a four building. You need two extra stone. It's easy. Whereas there is one player I play with that has to ask every time. Like, wait, is it what, what, how much is it going to cost me? Like every time we played and they played three times. So they, they definitely people can get hung up on that. Honestly, it, it does sound like something I would do. Uh, maybe keep an Excel sheet open on my phone as I play just to. <laughs> I don't know what Excel is. That, that seems like pushing it to seeming too hard. But like that is the basic, right? It, it's cost a, cost a wood and a stone plus one extra for every power you're short. And it's that figuring out what your power level is. And I don't know. It, it's just a little bit more math to be smooth. Now, speaking of power cost, that comes from that almost auction-like action selection system, which to me is the highlight of this game. This is my favorite part of Founders of Teotihuacan. Uh, what makes it sound out, stand out from other meaty Euro point salad games. I really dig the system of spending one to three actions, basically, to take your action and then getting a benefit based on how many tokens you used. I really dig that. I like this mechanic enough that it, I don't know if it needs to be this designer or another one. I want to see another game use this. At least a couple other games do something with this. I really like the system. 
I, I feel like I've seen it before, but I, again, without having played, it's hard to say. Maybe just not in such a restricted manner. Uh, it hurts a bit more when you've got so few resources to work with each round. Yeah, there, there, we did notice that the first few games were like, all in, three, you can't go there. And then later games, they're like, oh, and I ran out of actions and I can't do anything. And later games, people were being much more cautious, tending to spend only one per action. And then there's that whole benefit of if I sit back and I can wait for other people to go, I get that benefit. And I, I just, I like that decision space. Um, and it honestly flowed from, wow, this seems too powerful to, oh, no, this is too powerful to, no, actually, I think it's pretty balanced. Now, another thing I really liked was the way resource generation and spending works. I, I love the fact it was all physical on your grid. Like you place a building, you physically put your resources around that building, which means you have to leave room for them. And boards get crowded in the later rounds. And then you get those tiles where like, it wants you to put out six green buildings. But if I put out six green buildings, I'm not going to have room. And I also like that spending resources actually meant taking them off your board. And again, it can matter where you take them from. Like you make sure you split it up between your buildings so that that popular um, resource generation action is actually useful. And then all of this adds a rather high level of pre-planning and strategy to the game, both in what buildings you want to build, where you want to build them. And added to that, there's the architect, where you can only build in certain areas. And when you play a game with anything but three players, your architect's going to be on each side of your board once, which means you're going to be able to build in each district twice the entire game. And realizing that, knowing that last round, your architect's going to come back around and you're going to be able to build in that first zone again is a big part of the game. You literally do have to think four rounds ahead. It really is much more spatial game mm -hmm. uh, that I think is easy to get across in a review like this, and, you know, discussing it like this. So do make sure you hit up the blog after this to get a more in-depth look at the game if what we've talked about here has piqued your interest. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to get into all the different actions and what the buildings do and how your power affects them. I didn't want to do that for a video. So we do go into a lot more detail on the blog. Now, one problem with a high focus on strategy and planning is there really isn't a big tactical aspect of this game. Well, there is a decent amount of player interaction, especially with the timing of playing your action disc. And there can definitely be some hate drafting. As I mentioned earlier, there's only certain numbers of the buildings in play. And if you really need a blue temple to score and two players before you buy the two blue temples that are available, you're out of luck. Uh, the game at times, though, can feel like multiplayer solitaire. And this is a common problem in many mathy Euro games. So I can't say I'm surprised, but at least there is some interaction, yeah. which is better than some other games. Now, I will say the first play does very much feel like multiplayer solitaire because you haven't grasped all the concepts in the game and you're generally just looking at your own board. But you'll notice the more you play, the more interaction will happen, especially that hate draft thing is going to start coming up. It's going to be like, oh, they're going for this. Make sure to stop. Now, one aspect of play that has had mixed results with the players I played with, though, is the scoring system. Uh, during the game, this is very much a point salad. So everything you earn, you track right away on your board, which is kind of unique because like you're collecting mass tiles with numbers on them and you're putting things over things that have very clear point spots on them. It, and the st especially the stuff you collect, it seems odd to add that in. That to me, most games, you would add all that up at the end. But you actually track it as you're playing and you can earn a significant amount of points while playing the game, including possibly lapping the board before you've gotten to the end game scoring. But then you get to the end and you do the pyramid scoring which just feels detached from the rest of the scoring. Here you're just, you're looking, you're doing one district at a time and you're multiplying your pyramid colors to your temple colors. And if you play well, you can get massive amounts of points if you can collect a lot of the same colored tiles and temples. And I have seen twice now, the player who was in last place while playing the game, because you're tracking everything at once, scores so many points at the end, they win just because of pyramid scoring. And it just feels odd. I'm not saying it's bad or it's good, but that seems to be the, the dividing line for most of the people I played it with, what they liked or didn't like about it. It seems to be the, the deal breaker. Um, and I got to say the first couple plays again, that seems to be the shocker, the, the oh, wow, okay, I didn't realize that was going to have that big an impact on the entire game. And like we've even had a player say, well, why'd we bother playing the rest of the game if it was all just about pyramids? Um, like I, I know at least one player that thinks the only way to win is build the pyramids. 
I'm not convinced myself. Like we played this more than five times. I can't remember my exact play count. Might be six, might be eight, somewhere in there. I, I the pyramids do seem overpowered, but then everyone has the option to buy them. So I don't know if it's unbalanced. So how difficult is it as a result of this scoring variety, mid game and post game, to keep an eye on what your opponents are doing and sort of judge their relative score? Obviously, the scoreboard itself doesn't mm -hmm. help with that. Well. It all depends on how dedicated a gamer you are. All the information's there. It's all perfectly open. By tracking everything as you go, you know where everyone is relative to each other as you're playing, and you can do the math. Like, everyone's player boards are public info. If you look over, you can go, they have three tiles on level one, so that's three tiles, so two points per every temple they have, and they have one tile on level two, that's three points per temple they have. So in that district, they're going to score 12 points. You can do all that, but you need the right type of gamer. Like uh, I'm sure um, Darkling Blight in the chat would be all over it, having everyone's counts figured out. But while you're playing, I, I, I don't play that seriously, right? I'm kind of paying attention to what everyone's doing. And what got hard though, and here's the problem, is I can see, say Deanna, and this isn't that hypothetical, is collecting all of the blue tiles and all the blue temples, but there wasn't anything I could do to stop it because there's only two blue temple tiles up every turn. And unless I'm first player, which also rotates. So if you're playing four players, you're each going to be first player once. I happen to be sitting next to Deanna. The only time I got the draft before her was the turn I was first. And every other time she got to go before me. And if the other players don't stop her, and it just, it became difficult to stop that strategy. Now, I think if everyone was on board, you'd be like, oh, okay, the three of us have to stop her. But by stopping her, you're taking a blue temple you probably don't want because they're going to be limited supply. I'd rather grab a red or green temple because there's lots of them because no one else is going for them. So so it's you're hurting yourself to try to stop them, which is, like I said, the, the, uh, the scoring system is the most, I would say, controversial part of this game. So overall, I really dig this game. I, I enjoy it. Um, I like quick playing games that give me that feel of playing a meteor longer game. The, the games that feel heavier than their time limit. This is definitely one of those. This is one of those games where I play it and I'm like, oh, I've, I felt like I got in a, a good Euro tonight. That was nice. Like, no, I'm not burning, burning. I'm not like, oh, I, oh, I love it. The game was so tight. And we were so close. And if I just, it's not there, but it's, it's that fulfilling one hour. Like to be able to get that feeling in one hour is always awesome to me. Now, I will admit, I prefer the original Tale to Walken. I, I definitely like the, the original, the meat of that, the rondelles, the dice, the amount of things going on that you have to track. But this is way easier to get to the table, both due to its simpler system and shorter playtime. Now, my wife, on the other hand, who tends to win, so it's not that, and who does do all that math and counting and takes way longer than everyone on their turns, um, thinks it's okay. Like, it's all right. If we say, hey, we're going to play this tonight, she's not going to say, oh, I'll go read a book or I'll go do something else. She'll play. But she is never going to come downstairs and say, no, we should play tonight. Founders of Temple Walk. It's, it's an okay game to her. Now, another player we play with thought this was a much better game than Tale to Walk in City of the Gods because they felt City of the Gods felt like homework. Like it was too much work. It wasn't fun. It, it, was, it was taxing. It was work versus a game. Right. And that's certainly going to hit uh, that point for the cer that certain level of gamer who wants thinky, but not okay. brain burning. That's it too. Now, uh, one of the things that Deanna really didn't like about this game, and I think is utterly brilliant, so we're, we're totally on the different fence here, is the fact you get less actions every turn. The fact that, yeah, depending on the number of players, you either start with six or five discs. Let's start with five discs. That means you could t possibly take five actions on your turn. Well, the next round, you're down to four, then the three, then the two. The last turn of the game, you only get two discs. And if you want to put those together, you only get one action. And I thought this was brilliant because as the game goes on, there's way more AP. There's way more to think about. Again, you could count up everyone's board and figure out exactly where they're at before you draft the tile to figure out, is it worth gaining 10 points for you to, or instead stealing six from Deanna? What's better? What's what's going to win for me? And, and if I take this cube, then this cube, you could figure all that out. And what's great is that gets offset by only having two actions. So in the beginning of the game where it's pretty quick, 
you're like, oh, I'll take this action, then this action, then this action, then this action. And but the last round, you're like, oh, what am I going to do? Okay, I think I'm going to take that. And what I found happens is the time limit, the time for round one was about the same as round four, which I thought was brilliant. So as the complexity and depth of the game went up and, and the decision tree had branched all over the place, you only had two choices. When it was nice and it was easy, you had lots of choices. I loved it. Deanna hates it. She hated having less to do. She found it annoying at the end of the game. Like in most games, you build an engine, right? And in the last round, you want to run that big engine. Well, you can't. There's a, your engine had to have been built from the start, which again goes to that length of strategy in the game. So overall, oh, sorry. Skipped one thing, solo mode. I want to talk about that a bit. One more thing before I get to my final thoughts. I love the variable solo mode. I, I'm sure it's out there, but I haven't noticed it myself. The fact there are three different tables of eight goals for you. You have 512 different possible challenge combinations for solo play. I don't know anyone who's going to play this 512 times. You probably want to roll, but you could make a list of all the possible and cross them off as you played them. This is way cooler than your usual solo game of beat your high score over and over again. I love that concept. Indeed, this, there's a huge thumbs up for this aspect of the game. And again, more board gamers, take those, take those themes and, and ideas from uh, the video game world and apply yep. them to your game just like this has. Overall, founders of Teotihuacan, I added that extra who, sorry, founders of Teotihuacan is a solid, very quick playing, midway abstract tiling euro with a very interesting action selection mechanic that has surprising depth for a game of its length. While this is not, is an expansion, a re-implementation, or a new edition of Teotihuacan City of the Gods. This is very much its own game, which should appeal to a broader range of game players. Through the reduced weight, game time, and complexity may turn off fans of the original, I think this is going to appeal to more groups than the original did. For pretty much any group of gamers, though, for anyone who's listening right now, I personally think this is a try before you buy, which you can do on, I don't remember which, Tabletop Simulator or one of those. You can play this digitally um, or try it out at a local game store, go to a con, play a demo. Um, definitely watch an actual play before you grab this one. Due to just how different this is from City of the Gods, I can't even just say, hey, if you like the original, pick this up. Yeah, and sadly, while some restrictions remain, it's uh, still not as easy as it once was to try before you buy. Yeah, uh, It will be interesting to see what is going to happen in the coming months and weeks and years with game stores and demo copies. Uh, which is where those digital tabletops are really coming in to fill the gap. I got to say, I don't like playing on them. It's, it's not the same not the same it's great for some games but not all of them and this is one i think i would struggle with this game yeah, you want the digital. tactical I, I i honestly agree i think i you need it, that there's also nature. looking at there's also the visual i mean again yes. we're stacking things there's there's mm -hmm. a visual facial component to this game that is really hard to come across on like a, a board game arena or yep. you know one of those systems can't disagree with you so gamers who I think will enjoy this game are players who dig resource management and action selection combined with some special tile placement elements, like the, the restrictive tile placement. You can't just place things everywhere. In these aspects, Founders of Teotihuacan really shines. Fans of Stefan Feld-style point salad games may also find a lot to like here due to its near overwhelming number of scoring options while playing. Just don't get distracted by those and totally forget about the pyramid scoring while playing. So far, I've been trying to prove it that you can win without them, but it hasn't panned out. Work with the in-game scoring, but play for the end-game scoring. Now, what this is not, despite its quick 45-minute to an hour playtime, is a gateway game. There are multiple different mechanics at work here and layered scoring systems that I think make this a game for experienced hobby gamers. Though I can totally see a group of experienced gamers teaching this to a new player, I just can't see this as something that a group just getting into board gaming should pick up without having guidance of someone who knows these mechanics well from other systems. So I wonder what a graph of complexity of name 
versus ease of play would look like. I suspect most gamers still not heavily into hobby and Euro games would likely struggle to buy a game they had trouble pronouncing. Yeah, Boards and Dice has a thing going. They have the T series of games and none of them. Uh, Tekkenu is probably the easiest to pronounce out of all of them. But it's a thing. It's it's branding. Uh, all I will say is that Teotihuacan is actually spelled fairly close to how you pronounce it yep. when you get it right. So uh, if you and if you just do Teo, T-E-O, board game and Google it, it tends to work. All right. Before we wrap this up, I do have one other thing I want to bring up. And, and uh, Boards and Dice is probably going to hate me for this, but <laughs> the the similarities to another game that shares a name with this game, and that is found, or part of a name, shares some words with another game, and that is Founders of Gloomhaven. While playing Founders of Tale to Walken, I couldn't help but feel like there, I, it was at least inspired by Founders of Gloomhaven. Now, since then, I've been told very clearly from the publisher and designer, this is not the case. The games are in no way related. That said, I still see a lot of similarities. The way the board is split into districts and you're building in different districts and it affects which tiles you can play in the districts. The fact that it uses polyomino buildings in the first place is one thing that's already similar. The biggest though to me is the overall flow of the game. You are building resource generation buildings to create the resources you need to build point scoring buildings. That's the core of Founders of Gloomhaven and I found the way you build buildings in order to build temples here or buildings in order to build the pyramid is very similar to me. Officially, though, the games have nothing to do with each other. Well, that's it for our review of Founders of Teotihuacan. Have you played this one? What did you think? If not, have we tempted you to pick it up? Let us know in the comments below. As mentioned earlier by Sean, I, we also invite you to check out the written review of this tile laying game. It'll be live over at tabletopbellhop.com by the time this podcast hits your ears, where I'll be going into a lot more detail about the actual gameplay and how it works, as well as sharing some picks I snapped while playing. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. First after that review. All right, number one is Downfall of Pompeii. This was my first time playing this game in years. This is, this is we had to throw this in. This wasn't actually planned. To counterbalance, we were all about the new hotness. This game is from 2004. This is not the new hotness. I played a shrink copy that Deanna managed to find at Princess Auto. Now, this is a Canadian auto parts store that somehow had bargain basement games. I, I don't know. So Canadians, be sure to check your... Princess Auto for board game sales now and then. He pointed out it wasn't the only game there too. Like she picked me up this one, but there were others. They have a they have a couple of sections where you can, it's always worth peeking your head in there just to see what the heck has managed to land on those specific shelves. Yeah, I, I, I they I, oh, I don't know what that says. Discover. Oh, discover Dis discover discover unknown doesn't sound right. What is the actual name of that game? <laughs> it's the one with the procedurally generated lands unknown. Is that it? Yes. Discover lands unknown. I got it just for the end. Discover lands unknown came from there as well. So there you go. Like, I, and how are there still shrink copies of Downfall of Pompeii from Mayfair Games? You know what I? The, the version I have is the second printing. It is not the 2004 edition. It is a later printing, but it's not like a 2020, 2019 printing either. Anyway. First time playing Downfall and Pompeii in years. I had played my friend Jamie's copy many years ago and thought it was neat. It was a it was a cool enough game, but I didn't feel the need to get it. Um, but it's I didn't have kids then, for one. Uh, we sat down to play two players, Dan and I. Was enjoying it, and I was like, oh, yeah, I remember this. This this, this is the game. I, this is neat. Yeah, we're, we're filling the city of Pompeii. And, and once we've moved in our initial people, we start inviting our relatives to join us. Yep, yep, I remember this. Oh, no, Vesuvius erupts. Oh, now we have to run and try to get out the gates. Totally dig it. I, I like the different phases of the game. Um, it, it, it's a neat game. There's a fiddly bit with setting up the cards, which I hate. I hate setting up the deck. Like, it has the most complicated set up a deck of cards that I've ever read in any game. And I played a ton of um trick-taking games and stuff to have some weird rules you you literally make seven piles of four 
then take the rest and take so many cards off. Then you shuffle in a card and then you put another card on top. And then you take four of those decks and put like, it's, it's, I couldn't do it off the top of my head. And I've now played the game a couple times. Um, so that's it. You're, you're, you're moving in, you're bringing your relatives in and then you're running. That's pretty much the game. Yep. That's uh, it's, it's straightforward, but it's fun. <laughs> now, then we got to the end of the game. So one you 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 get so many people based on the player count we took our people we each had i'm going to pick up a number off the top of my head 13 people escape we both had 13 people escape like oh what the heck happens now and trust me it felt tense like like i didn't know we were both like we're like oh, i'm gonna get this guy i'm gonna get this guy we're like okay the tiebreaker is whoever has the least people in the volcano. Every time a person dies, you throw them in the volcano. If you're a proper gamer, you also go, ah, or whatever. You, you do your best Wilhelm scream. If you're an even better gamer, you put a tea light in the candle too, so it's glowing when you throw them in. But anyway, we haven't made that upgrade yet. So we're like, but but that doesn't matter. Deanna's called it right away. She's like, that's not going to matter. And sure enough, we have the exact same. Because, well, we started with the same number, and we saved the same number, so the ones in the volcano would be the same. Like, what the heck? Like, how bad? Like, this is from 2004. This was an Aaliyah game. How would they not fix that in a second printing? That's that's certainly an odd one. When, like, when, 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 when I initially saw the tiebreaker was, oh, you know, we had the same number, the same number of people. In the game. I was, I, I, I had imagined in my head that there must be somewhere else that people can go. Oh. There must be some oh. other mechanic that takes players out of the game that isn't into your escape or a volcano. That's it. It's escape. The thing was we tied on escape. Like Deanna could have had more people escape than I did. And she would have won the game straight up, right. but we didn't, we played equally well. So there's another problem. Okay. Component count. So I play yellow. Deanna plays green. I can't remember. I don't think Deanna, I can't remember there was green. I think there's green, whatever. We sit down to play and we couldn't because there weren't enough yellow pieces. Like, what? Yeah, there was no green, there was blue. The game does not include enough of all four colors. There are enough to play, but if you're playing two players, you can't play yellow. And I'm like, who does that? Like, how much did you save by not giving me five wooden cylinders? But you gave me a plastic volcano. <laughs> Like, instead of giving me a plastic volcano, give me a cardboard volcano and give me enough dang cylinders. Like, that's just, like, I don't know if Mayfair is still printing this, but come on. <laughs> and to be honest, I own one other game by them called Patrician that did the same thing. But Patrician, first thing in the rule book was what colors to use with what player count. That's not in the rules. That is, it's, uh, that's, like, unforgivable. Like, come on. Like, Although, weird, in, let's be honest. If yellow, if it wasn't yellow, if it had been blue where there hadn't been enough cubes, you guys wouldn't even know. That's true. Until we went to play with four players and you had to count them out and we go, wait, there's less of this one? <laughs> I, I, I'm just bizarre. Like, utterly bizarre. So yeah, first play of Downfall of Pompeii, despite loving it years ago, did not go well. Next up, Pile of Shame. So that first one was Pile of Shame, right? I just got the game. Got it. I think it was my birthday. Might have been Christmas. I think it was birthday. Um, next was Ex Libras. So first play, Oth Self Esteem. Man, I should have got this off. This is one of those games you play it and you're like, I didn't play this before. Like it's been sitting downstairs for a while. I, and I will say why. The the reason that I didn't, because it was intimidating. Like you, there's a ton of stuff. There's like, uh, I don't even know, nine, nine to 12 different player boards. And then there's like, 20 or 30 different worker placement boards there's three decks of cards that you stack together like it's there, there's a rule book that is significantly thick for a board game like I'm, I'm thinking 24 pages or something like that maybe even 20 the thing is the rule book is one half no probably two-thirds summary of what all those rooms do what all those tiles do and what all those player rooms do so the actual rules were like, I don't know if it's four pages, six pages. It was nothing compared to how thick the book is. So anyone who has asked the Libra says, just like, oh, I don't want to learn that. Look how thick the book is. Don't just go play. 
then once we started playing simple like like really on a, uh, honestly a basic worker placement game you have your main apprentice and then you have two minions and you put them on the spots and there's little spots to put them that look their gnomes sorry your gnomes your gnome assistants there's little gnome spots with the pointy hats that you put them on and it's really obvious because the first room only has one so only one person can go there you put your thing on you do what it says on the board like i just taught you how to play ex libris basically without some of the weird limitations and scoring but like the actual mechanics are play some min minion do a thing and i gotta say though the, there is also no reason to read that book because you got this pile of rooms and at least with two players we only used about half of them and you only need to read the ones that come up so just start playing fair enough now quick summary of play you're building a library it's in the fantasy world cool right you're using minions to take actions when it starts the only options available are your home board which all you can do there is shelve a book or draw cards which is basically go shopping for books so you either set up a section of your library or you go shopping and then the other option is this thing to draw cards and it's based on how many minions you play and that's it but then at the end of the round, new build, new new rooms, I think there are, or new buildings come into play. And then that next round, you now have the, the original room and two more to choose from. So it's, it slowly grows, which is really neat. And then at the end of the round, I thought this was a brilliant mechanic I'd never seen in a worker placement game before. These are numbered according to power. So all these randomized rooms are number one to whatever, 20 or whatever it is. The lowest point building, so the, the least powerful building out of the two that showed up randomly, stays in play and becomes permanent for the rest of the game. And the other one goes away. And I just, I thought that was really neat. And then next round, another building. Two buildings come up. You can already use the permanents. At the end of the round, one of those goes away and one stays in play forever. That is such a neat worker placement mechanic. And I love the fact that it was the lower one every time. So like you could get a huge building out, but it's probably not going to stay up. Like it's huge. But if you get the luck of the draw and you get two high numbers, you could end up with like a really powerful building out early in the game. Or you could end up getting this really awesome building you really want to play, but you drew a two and you're stuck with the two. And it, I thought that was really neat. Um, basically, what you're doing is trying to build your, your library. And of course, the books have to be in alphabetical order. And you're trying to collect different kinds of books. And I don't want to get into the full details of that, but it's just really well done. Now, there are also lots of different player boards. Like, this plays four players. So you expect, like, four to eight player boards, and there's, like, 12. And every player board's asymmetric. It was really neat because I played a wizard who could shift his shell, the shelves. Deanna played a gelatinous cube, which had the coolest meeple I've ever seen in a game. It's, it's literally a little gelatinous cube thing. I, I actually was wondering what it was when we opened the box. All the rest are wooden meeple, and there's this little plastic gelatinous cube. Um, her power wasn't as good. It had a thing where if I went where the gelatinous cube was, I got stuck in it and had to give her a card. Well, I just didn't go where she was. She thought the wizard was overpowered versus the cube, which may have been true with only player, two players because we only played two players. Um, played fine, two players, unlike the other game we played the same night. I really dig this. I, I think you would like this game. Like, this is the whole book theme. I'm sure you're probably already sold. Yep, yep. No, absolutely. Next, we played the through i i want to say the second mission of star trek unlock but it whoa, whoa, ends whoa, up whoa 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 what? you're just insulted half the sci-fi fans in the world what did uh, i say you said star trek oh well maybe there is a star trek unlock <laughs> <laughs> they're both the same thing right there now i've offended the rest of them all right so next we played through our second mission of star wars unlock star wars unlock is the only one that's out there i would love a star trek unlock to be honest that'd be great set it in any series that'd be good I'd, though the original series would be the most fun um so we played through our second mission this was the entire family so we played with all the kids we actually invited d's mom to play as well um i thought holly was going to jump in for a bitch but she did jump in right at the end um i'd still really dig the unlock system, which is kind of neat. Like I just the way it works. And I gotta say, I'm fascinated now by all these different puzzle escape room games. Like just the way the exit games work, where it's all about figuring out the clues and like literally tearing stuff apart and folding things and honestly lighting things on fire for one of them. Like there's a lot going on in those. Versus, say, the Coded Chronicle system, like the Goonies, which we reviewed last week, where it's all about combining your individual character skills to get 
four digit codes that you look up in books and read that gives you kind of a which way thing. Like there was just so many different interesting things going on with escape room games. Whereas this one is very app based. It's you have a single deck of cards and you have an app and that's it. And you don't destroy, you don't ruin anything. And you have a card in front of you and need to figure out what to do. And most of it is just finding numbers on that card that gives you more cards to draw. But then there's going to be other things you interact with the app and everything. And I'm just fascinated by all these different varieties of ways to do that escape room in a box style game. Totally fair. Now, one thing I didn't realize is it ends up we've been playing them out of order. So at first I was surprised that this was significantly easier than the first one and i'm like what i thought they were supposed to increase in difficulty so here's a pro tip for anyone who picks up star wars unlock the order on the box cover is not the order of difficulty the order of the decks in the box is the order of difficulty which does not match the cover so i saw the cover and the cover shows the tauntaun the hot one then it shows a star fight and then it shows something with the new order it's the new newest series and i'm like what I just assume the Tauntauns first. Like, that's how they're presented on the box. And instead, they went with graphic look or something. So this one is easier. So it's interesting to know that um, we did the more difficult one first, which was more difficult. It was, um, we didn't do as well. We we got way more stuck in the first one. Um, and we actually had to use a hint the last time. Now, I'm not trying to say this was easy, but this was not as hard as the other one. Now, overall, um, I recommend it. Uh, it, it's good. The, the, the series is good. Um, there were a couple issues. The, the first is the problem of playing with more people. So we even have people in the chat now talking about if, if Holly had joined us, the problem is they're smaller than tarot size cards. And it's just a deck of cards and just an app on your phone. I guess you could put the app on a tablet, but it's meant for one person to interface. And it's just not easy to share this game. Whereas like the Code of Chronicles, everyone grab a book. You definitely are keeping everyone interested, but you can't really have three people trying to find the hidden number on the code cylinder. Like you just, you can't, you can pass it around. And we had way too much of, let me see it. Let me see it. Can I see that now? Are you done with that yet? Like it was almost fighting over the cards. Uh, the kids in particular wanted to be the first to look at a card to hopefully see the thing. And after, you know, a millisecond went by the other kids, like, obviously you can't see it. Let me see it. So that was a bit of an issue. And the app integration, which I'm not even going to get into the whole why app integration may be bad. Just don't let this sit on your shelf too long is all, all I'll say about that. You do get to do cool things. And some of it's really neat. Like there was an awesome way that we got to basically role play interacting with a droid, asking it questions to solve a puzzle. And that was brilliant. That's like, it's not a spoiler because you get a basic plot and save your droid and get out. So that is really well done, but only one person gets to interact with that app and the person interacting with that app. If they don't understand what you're supposed to do can be a problem. So while the app's cool, it can be an issue. And I mentioned this when we played the first part. And when I get to my final review, this is going to be my biggest complaint about this game. In the first game, we took a couple penalties by not doing things the way the app wanted us to or not understanding how to use the app properly. And this happened again due to fumbling the interaction, fumbling with the interface of the UI. We had the right answer, but fast fingered it and another time hit the wrong button and took penalties. Now, the whole thing is this is a time game. You have one hour to complete all of them. They, there's a one hour time limit. And once you take the penalty, it's done. Like it just, man. And there's your one minute penalty, two minute penalty, depending on what you did wrong. And I got to say, I wish this app had a, I didn't mean to do that button. And I get it. There, there's people out there. They're going to cheat. They're going to be like, Oh no, wait, I didn't enter the wrong code. Yeah. These are the same people that put their fingers in the which way books and go back and see what actually happened and then go to their friends and tell them, yeah, I finished it without dying. And they know in the back of their head, they cheated and they're going to have to live with that for the rest of your lives. <laughs> I don't think the app should need to penalize you. It's a cooperative game. This isn't a contest. It's not a tournament. Anyone cheating is just hurting themselves. I really wish there was an undo. You and heck, if you want to do it as a tournament, put a tournament button in there. 
or you just didn't make it difficult enough so that you know it's not easy to oh as soon as you hit the wrong button you could just go back again you know pull down a menu jump into another screen and then hit an oops button to go back or something yeah yeah don't make it easy to exit out and it's, it's just fat fingers small phones right it's it's hitting the wrong button on a number pad which you know on a tablet i guess would have been better so my last gameplay this week is Downfall of Pompeii. We're back to where we started, full circle, back to the the old crusty games. This time though, with four players, and honestly, that fixed everything. Um, uh, there's just enough components in all four colors to play four players. You do have to take some out of one, or, or no, you don't take any out. You use all of them, uh, whatever it is. There are just enough components playing four players. You have to pull them out of the colors, certain colors. Uh, played great. Um, it, it works, right? Uh, my mother-in-law and oldest daughter really enjoyed it. Gwen in particular really liked it. She asked if we can play that again. Um, none of the problems. None of the two-player problems. Yeah. Now, it, it, it's another case, and we've complained about this before. This is not a two- to four-player game. This is a three- to four-player game, and I really wish that's what's said on the box. You know what, publishers? We get that you're trying to sell to a wider market, but you know what? If you don't anger your clients, you'll sell more games. So put the right numbers on there. Yeah. Don't try and squeeze another count in there just to try and make more people buy it. It just ends up upsetting fans. Oh, it's true. And yeah, I get it. You want to control all the market. There's plenty of publishers and plenty of games. Now with 6,000 games a year coming out, let me go play a two-player game. I'll enjoy as a two-player game. Don't waste my time with a three to four player game that it didn't have a variant. Maybe it needed one. Maybe I, I, I bet you, cause the game's from 2004. If I go on board game geek, I can find a two player variant that makes the game work, <laughs> but I shouldn't have to do that. So yes, I, I'm going to swap earlier on my, my complaints about the game, pick it up. It's a great game. Just make sure you have three to four players. Don't pick it up. If you plan on playing two. And I totally next time I, we don't go shopping anymore, but if, if it was normal times, I, I probably already would have hated Dollarama just to get a flickering tea light because <laughs> that really is needed. That needs to sit in the box with the game. So anytime we play it, we'll pull it out. Uh, kids are already asking to play it again. So it, it's a win that way. I may pull it out this weekend with Tori and Kat just to because they've never played it. it it's solid. I, I'm actually shocked by how fun a game from 2004 is. And I will note, this is family weight. You could play this with kids as long as they're cool with the theme of volcanoes erupting and people getting killed by pyroclastic flows. You can then go watch a documentary on Pompeii and show them why why this the terrible thing happened. <laughs> so if you're okay with the fact you're gamifying what was pretty much a, a cataclysmic event, this could be played by anyone. Fair enough. There's even a family variant on the uh, board game geek page. <laughs> See, I told you there's probably variants that make it. It's old enough that people, had, there weren't enough games out. So people had to like modify the games. They had to make them work better <laughs> instead of just moving on to another game. <laughs> so how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? Uh, so I did confirm today. My notes say, I think, though I haven't confirmed we're gaming with KTOR. That has been confirmed. Uh, we got KTOR coming over. Um, besides getting in at least one game of Charterstone, we need to get Charterstone finished. I, I missed out on reviewing another Stonemeyer game because we haven't finished yet. Note to reviewers, remember, if you sign up for a legacy game, you got to finish the legacy game. It's going to take a while. I, I'm not actually all that upset because we're, we're enjoying Charterstone. Um, I, we're going to play at least one Charterstone. I think we're going to do the same thing as last time we're here and start with that. That way we make sure to get it in. Um, we have three more to go, 10, 11, and 12, and then Charterstone is done. I really want to play Ex Libris again uh, and show it off because I think, again, they'll dig it. It's a theme that I think they will enjoy. And I'm tempted to play Pompeii with them. Um, and I think I want to talk to them about possibly, um, this goes back to last week's AMA. Everyone, what legacy game are you going to play when you finish Charterstone? I'm thinking that legacy game might be an RPG. Uh, that might be our chance to play the One Ring. But I want to talk to them about it because I kind of want my kids to play. So I'm thinking like maybe if we can start an earlier night or, you know, we only play for two hours, like they get here six, six thirty. Maybe we finish eating by seven. We play for two hours and my kids go still get to go to bed and calm down at nine. So it might be some short sessions, but that's something we'll be talking about on Friday. And I am sure if we do start playing the one ring, we'll be talking about it here, even though we'll be using dice that don't read quite right. <laughs> uh, oh, an update on that. Not to 
until the summer at the earliest for replacements. So they do not have any. They have to be printed. So I got an email actually earlier saying that it will be at, at the earliest summer. All right. <clears throat> Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. John P. Kelly of the Excellent Gaming and BS Podcast. Thank you. Andrew Dacey. Thank you, Andrew. Brian Van Beek. Thank you, Brian. Oh, we called out the wrong Brian this week. Diane Tuzano. Thanks, Ma. The Misdirected Mark Podcast. Talking gaming and game mastering live every Tuesday night. Well, that was the double bell. That means our shifts are coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcasts on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter. No, we can't sign up at newsletter.tabletop. Uh, technically, you can. <laughs> you, you technically can, but you end up on our old newsletter list, which we then have to go compare and port you over to the other one. So it works, but... We're working on it. It'll get done at some point. It's kind of low on the priority list. Links down below. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts and going back to earlier in the show, if you want access to our private Discord, all you got to do is go to patreon.com patreon slash tabletop bellhop and support at any level. And we'll get you in on that Discord so you can hear our hot takes or are somewhat negative no it's a, it's a good place it, it's not a lot of talking but we share like hey check this out look at what we're interested in what do you think of this we get a lot of uh hype going in there and i got a couple feeds coming in with board game geek news and stuff like that would love to see more activity there and you can help make that happen well that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight for the lobbyists thanks for joining us be sure to stick around and join us in the pedo suite for the after show and stop by youtube sundays for brunch for Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.